Testing? Okay, great. Hi, everybody. We're going to slowly start getting uh, ready to get going. Um, I'm going to ask those of you who are sitting there, I know those look like the comfy chairs, but I'd like you to be here so you can see better. And I can kind of bring your little table right here so you can have your coffee and your cream. <laughs> so if I'm going to ask everyone to move a little bit more forward. Um, uh, here we go. Please sit down if you've just walked in, Lavinia. Um, this is a problem like knowing everybody. Um, so just a little bit of um, perspective before I hand over to Tumi. But we decided to keep the in-the-room um, interactions really kind of intimate. Uh, the room will fit 40 people. Some people are coming tomorrow. Some people are coming in later. So this morning is a, actually a really nice start with everybody here. We hope that by the end of the session, you'll all know each other very, very well. And for the people online, we have lots of breakouts and opportunities for you not only to connect with each other, but also to connect with um, each other. I mean, sorry, each other and the people who are physically in the room. Um, I want to hand over to our MC. <laughs> so our MC is a very special MC because she was actually one of our participants in the boot camp last year. Um, she was working for Baza at the time um, and working in the creative industries and very fascinated by what can happen at, in the digital creative industries and joined the whole program um, and is very, very... Um, kind of excited to be here today and she attended all of Saturday so she could like touch base with the with the format so we felt we needed an MC who knew what they were talking about and um, so to me please come ahead yeah thank you so much thank you so much Dr. Tegan good morning uh, everybody good morning good morning good morning um, yeah welcome to the African Intermediaries Forum um, this is our first kind of inter-regional meeting uh, following uh, the successful online boot camp that I had the privilege of being a part of. I remember applying and thinking, will they even select me? I know nothing about gaming <laughs> or animation, but I definitely think I'm a mediator, connector, intermediary. Um, so being part of that cohort was really insightful um, and I'm so excited to be here. Um, my job is very easy to ask the questions, right? Or to bring the people who have the answers. Um, but I'm really hoping that we can make it as robust as possible, as fun as possible. I was here on Saturday um, for um, the, the intermediaries um, uh, meeting and session, and that was so interesting because it wasn't so rigid, so strict. We really played, we um, connected, and, and had a good time. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm hoping that today, the next two days, is uh, we, you know, we build on that, um, looking at you know African inter intermediaries, particularly um, in the digital creative industry. So, as mentioned, my name is Dumi. Dumi with a why. It's a thing. I ask a lot of why questions. Um, but yeah, I'm really, really excited to be moderating, facilitating, and emceeing what I believe is a brilliantly curated program um, where we'll hear insights from across Sub-Saharan Africa um, and beyond. Um, it is a hybrid event, so we also have people joining us from across the world um, who are joining us on Zoom, who are also joining us on different social media platforms. Our hashtag is hashtag Fagugesi2022, and I'm hoping that we can share our comments, our questions, our provocations, and contributions um, on that or via that platform to make it as, in as inclusive um, as possible. It's also a Monday, so I can feel the energy is a bit like, mm, what's going on here? <laughs> so I'm hoping that we can slowly relax and to it, have fun, meet different people, um, and really just challenge ourselves to ask those why questions 
um, around this particular topic. All right, so just a quick overview around the format and the structure of this event. Um, today, day one, we are asking the question, who sets the compass? And we'll be looking at you know, actions, um, tensions, assumptions, expectations around these assumed roles um, of intermediaries. Tomorrow, we'll ask the question, who steers the domain? We'll look at how we can challenge this space that we're navigating um, in research, in business, in intelligence, um, and also in audience engagement, particularly on diverse digital platforms um, you know, across the region as well as um, in the diaspora. So there'll be panel discussions, open fora, um, moments and opportunities for us to network, um, and of course, talks by various experts who see themselves as intermediaries, um, who've assumed these roles and are making sure that the creatives in the ecosystem are able to do the work that they do. So these are people who are in publishing, um, who are in communications, who are measuring the impact of the work um, that we are doing. So yes, hashtag Fagugesi 2022. Um, and then in terms of Wi-Fi details, um, the Wi-Fi name is Simulhong-General, and the password is Digital Innovation. Um, if you're looking for restrooms for people who are here in Johannesburg, my left, your right-ish behind the stage. Um, and those who are on the Zoom, if you feel a bit tired, just switch your video off, okay? <laughs> switch your video off, but make sure you, s you share your contributions in the chat um, so that we can really include, include them as much as we can. All right, now before we start, I'd like us to give a big, big shout out to Timu uh, to the team that has been working on this amazing festival, Eduardo and the team, and of course our partners, GIZ, if we can give them a big, Warm round of applause, well done. <laughs> it's been so interesting and so different, right? Like we've been doing some boring things in the past few years and I think this is the first time where I'm like, okay, we're moving, we're moving, we're innovating. Um, uh, yeah, so really excited as well about what else is going to come out of this session. Now for our opening comments and remarks, I'd like to call, um, not on stage, but online, one of our key partners, um, Angelica, Frey Oldenburg, who is joining us um, online on Zoom. Um, and just a quick overview of who she is. Uh, she's the head of the Project Culture and Creative Industries at GIZ. Uh, and this is a BMZ-funded program that operates in six countries, focusing on job creation and income generation for creatives. And will tell us a little bit about why we are here today and the objectives of this particular forum. Let's give her a big round of applause as she joins us online. Thank you so much, Dumi. Thank you so much, uh, and dear participants, for this uh, warm welcome. Um, dear participants of the African Intermediaries Forum for the Digital Creative Industries, I would like really to extend a very warm welcome to all of you joining this first ever Interregional Digital Creative Industries Forum. Here at this festival, African intermediaries come together aiming at finding solutions that strengthen this digital creative industry. So I'm really happy to welcome you all and to receive this very warm welcome from your side. Because she has set beliefs in this sector as it is a promising in terms of future job creation, new market development. And we believe that this sector, as it is a growing sector, has high potential in implementing the pathway also for equal participation of women, reducing inequalities in general, and setting up fair work conditions in the creative industries. We are here today already excited about the forum to start because of the important research which university in partnership with Paco Gesi have been doing. Research that aimed at understanding the landscape of intermediaries in the digital creative industries in Africa with a special focus on animation, gaming and immersive media. I am really very proud that our cross-regional GIZ project, we call it Global Project Cultural and Creative Industries, that has been already mentioned, has supported this research on intermediaries, and I feel really excited to see what has and still will emerge of it. We know by now that you, as intermediaries, have a very crucial role in providing digital creative professionals access to markets and monetization. This is vital 
to make creatives visible and successful on a local but also global scale. And we would like to invite you again to draw your attention to the issue of gender equality in your work that I mentioned earlier. Festivals as Fakugesi offer a creative space where innovative solutions are being ignited, supported and further developed. Brilliant minds of the digital creative economy come together today and tomorrow, share their thoughts, their ideas, their work and jointly develop new approaches that will be moving the compass, as to put it in today's forum title. The findings of this week's session will be of great relevance for our GIZ project and partner countries, because on behalf of the German government, we do not only support South Africa, but also Kenya, Senegal, and furthermore, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq in their culture and creative industries development. The insights we will receive through your engagement in this forum will be guiding us from now on in our future support to intermediaries in the digital creative industries. These insights will also help us to investigating further in the topic of gender equality to income prospects for creative professionals and to create an ecosystem that helps the creative industries thrive. I am, to be honest, really sorry not being able to participate in person, but I'm sure that I miss a lot of very fruitful and exciting exchanges. So I would already like to thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your efforts to come to Johannesburg from across the country and from abroad. Thank you for your creativity and your ideas that you will bring into this forum. And I wish you a very inspiring day and days here at Fakugesi Festival. I'm sure that with your help from now on, we will be moving the compass. Thanks a lot. I think we can make it a stronger applause, especially, <laughs> especially because I've seen like 30 people joining us online who are already engaging. So we don't want them making a, you know, a louder noise than we are already, all right? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Angelica. I think I love that challenge uh, for us to share as much as possible. It's really amazing about this forum. Uh, somebody asked on Saturday, oh, we're tired of talking. We're tired of just, you know, sharing who's documenting this and what are we going to do? Um, when we leave tomorrow. So there are people who are documenting all the insights that are being shared, all the talks that are being shared. Um, and there's already a platform that's been launched. So um, beyond this conversation, there's already tangible um, action um, that will you know, help us then move forward. I'd like to now call on stage um, a change, change agent. Um, let me actually read your bio properly so that I don't mess it up. <laughs> um, the CEO of Timulukhong uh, Precinct, she is um, also uh, founded the Impact Hub uh, in Johannesburg in 2010. And along with fellow Obama leaders across Africa, uh, Ms. Leslie Williams um, contributed to the published poetry and anthology, A Better World, Hope from Africa. Leslie is also completing her master's uh, in inclusion uh, innovation, and the title of her dissertation is The Influence of Cultural Diplomacy on South Africa's Animation Industry. Let's give her a warm round of applause as she comes on stage. Thank you, to me with a Y. <laughs> I've got it, I've got it. Welcome to Tsimolokhong Precinct, everyone. You are in my home, in my office, and uh, also for those of you online. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Tegan and the team of Wits uh, School of Arts to, uh, for being the custodian of, of this critical, critical work. work. I think all of us can agree that there has been a gap and we need to diligently keep working on it. So, so thank you to you. And then also to our partners for making this happen, uh, GIZ, for bringing the fuel, the power, the energy uh, to actually be the drivers to make it happen, to enable it. It's super, super, super critical. And it's just beautiful to see all of us convening um, in this way, to have a conversation about something that matters to all of us in a collective way. 
want to position some of this work um, within Simulukhong. So a uh, few of you may not know, so Simulukhong is a digital innovation precinct we own by, by Wits University. And we define digital innovation as this intersection between hardware, software, and content. So from a software perspective, we have quite a number of skills development programming around coding, networking, testing, um, to make sure that we, we're really developing the kind of skills that the nation needs right now from a software perspective. Uh, from a, a hardware perspective, uh, some of you may have interacted with our makerspace, especially yesterday during the maker day. And um, just over four years ago, we launched the Digital Content Hub. And this is really for us where Fakugezi Festival um, is located. And I'll speak maybe to some of the things that we are doing there. So the one is that uh, we are the home of a uh, Digital Lab Africa, which was uh, initiated by IFAS and is at home at Simulukhong now. And this is our pan-African um, accelerator of, of projects, particularly in animation, gaming, and, and XR. So that has really been our touch point along with Fakugezi to make sure that um, we're being influenced by what's happening across the continent and that there is this interaction between local, global, um, and international. We've also then built out um, an animation uh, studio and academy. And again, looking at the entire journey of an animator uh, from that perspective. Um, off the back of, again, Fakugezi last year and the, and, and the Game Jam last year, we then launched a, a gaming hub in partnership with Telcom. And we want to do the same with XR going forward. So we've been asking and holding a lot of questions ourselves. And what we know for sure is that we need a strong and strengthened intermediary network. Um, and that it absolutely is only going to take collaboration for us to move the, fo the, the, the compass um, forward, as this team suggests. So um, I'm, here going, I'm going to be listening and learning a lot over the next two days. But I thought I would um, use the mic to throw some of my own questions um, into the pot so it can stir and, and, and find its place. Um, somewhere. So, um, like Tumi mentioned, I, I'm focusing a lot of my um, master's thesis around animation and cultural diplomacy. So, I have been holding the question for the last two years what defines an African animation innovation ecosystem? But even broader, um, how do we extend that to defining the digital creative innovation ecosystem? And I think what we're doing over these two, two years will go a long way in, in helping to answer that. Um, what are the value chains that currently exist? And what do we need to prioritize in building it out? What common agreements do we need, to, do we need in place to catapult the industry? And why I say common, common agreements is because I think there are kind of like subtle debates happening around um, that we may not reach consensus about immediately, but it's good that we keep asking the questions. So I'll name a few of, the, of, of these debates. Um, as an African continent, should we be focusing on developing our IP or being service workers, workers um, to the world? Um, do we build out the differences in animation, gaming, and immersive tech from the onset? Or do we find and, and leverage the commonalities in the audiovisual sector, particularly to bring stakeholders on board um, like government? So there are a lot of questions and um, that, that are, I think, out there in the domain. And if we map out again who are the intermediaries, what are we doing, then we can fully understand what are the next actions and hopefully grow the pie so that we, have a, we can answer yes to all of the questions and all of the debates. So thank you. I look forward to being a participant along with you for the next two days. Thank you so much, Leslie. Yeah, quite a lot of questions, um, which I hope we will start to unpack in the next uh, two days. Um, again, just a reminder to everybody who's joining us online, please populate your, your, your questions and comments as well in the chat, and we'll make sure that we include them in the pot of all of these questions that are emerging from the conversation. Um, now I'd like us uh, to take a different focus. We're going to look at, um, or we're going to introduce a keynote speaker. Um, and the goal of this kind of talk is really to give us an example of an intermediary as, you know, from a lens of a developmental um, organization, one that is in the Western Cape, um, yes, but 
you know, more than, more than the location, we're looking at the methodology, ways in which they are able to follow a multifaceted, a multi-pronged approach um, that, you know, really looks at um, fostering uh, meaningful and productive uh, partnerships across government or between government, um, the creative sector itself, uh, creators, um, and different other intermediaries. So I would like to welcome on stage um, Monica hemming Rovic, who heads up the Film and Media Promotion Unit at West Grove. A little bit about her. Um, yes, she's also um, Western Cape's. She also works for the Western Cape's region in tourism uh, trade and investment promotion agency. She previously also worked with Durban International Film Festival's industry program. She was seminal in the formation formation of talents at uh, Durban with the biennial talent uh, program. She works as strategic advisory. She works as a strategic advisory um, on various projects in the Western Cape and beyond. Let's welcome her on stage. Um, at the end of her talk, we will give an opportunity to our audience uh, to also ask a couple of questions. Um, yeah, and to comment on the... Aha. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, it's a digital innovation festival. So everything, we're trying to keep um, it paperless. So if you can go to the QR code at the end, at the back of your program, you'll be able to see all the speakers, their profiles, and even the topics that we're unpacking today. I don't think I did your bio justice, but let's welcome uh, Ms. Monica hemmings uh, Robic for our keynote address. Thank you so much to me with a B. <laughs> Um, I've, I'm so excited to be here. I won't be able to sit elegantly for half an hour. That's my time limit. And I have to look at my props, one of which is a clock. Otherwise, I'll speak too much. And um, I'm from Westgrow, and I am a digital intermediary. I'm very excited to be discovering who and what I am at this age. Westgrow is the tourism, trade, and investment agency for the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town. We're at TIPA. Yes, okay, I'm, yes, I've got a beautiful uh, team here taking care of me digitally and with sound. I think it sounds very good, thank you. So my unit is uh, now being slowly rebranded to take care of the creative industries but it is the film and media unit. And we have a trade promotion, we have an investment promotion, we have tourism promotion and facilitation. And our goal as our agency is Section 31C in the Western Cape legislation, that's what we're called, and we're funded by them, and the city of Cape Town gives money in an MOU, is to grow the economy to be one of the leading regional economies in the world. So how are we going to do that? We have a lot to sell and attract people. We have five districts and the city of Cape Town. And we are in southern Africa, which is a great place to be. Africa is amazing, and southern Africa is a great place to be. We have a story to tell, and we have great storytellers to help us tell it. And we need to know those stories, and we need to be able to share those stories. So as an agency, we develop vanilla stories that we can give to people to rebrand and align their stories. So the Discover Cape Town is one of those brands. But I want to take a deep dive into a unit I didn't talk about. It's actually a strategic project called Air Access. I'm using this first before I get to the film unit because it's easier to understand. We all know flights are needed to connect us physically. And without them, research has shown that headquarters tend to make a decision to go with a direct flight 20% more of the time. And that's actually quite a, a big difference when you're trying to attract headquarters to your city and your region. So, this is a strategic project with its own strategic board, but it doesn't need a CEO because we have one in Westgrow. It doesn't need a CFO because we have one in Westgrow. We have all the alignment, and the money that goes into this is watched very carefully by those big eyeballs, including our principals and the private sector. We have a private sector board bar this province and the city. 
So they can put numbers to their industry, to their flights. What does it cost when you don't have those people flying in? Well, there you go, whole bunch of numbers, whole bunch of people, big reports, downloadable, free to access. This research is done by our agency for people. And they've been very successful in the last few years, three direct flights to the US. For me, when you're thinking big studios and service work, yes, we do want them to come and use our craft, our crew, our talent, and our locations. To finish up on that, the numbers drive all of our remit, tourism, events, and business. And remember, cargo, we're shipping, we're an export country. But this is me. This summer, from a place with an endless summer. So that's one of our vanilla brand campaigns, and it's done for our unit. Each of our units gets stories told like that from our fabulous comms team, and it's done collaboratively. Everything we do at Westgrow is done based on research and plugged into plans. So my team answers to, uh, along with trade promotion, investment promotion, to our chief trade officer, and tourism has another ex-co member. So we're very aligned, we're very flat, we're very fast, we're very agile. And in our unit, we have to grow our region to become a world-class film and media production hub. And we are measured by production value spend assisted and by full-time equivalent jobs. And we offer tons of services. We also produce projects and research. I'm going to show you a couple here. Um, downloadable from our website because we are green now, a very beautiful filmmaker's guide to the Western Cape and our creative locations, which is quite a, a lovely project. And we do have digital photos for people to use. Each unit does similarly and more. Last year, we recorded bringing two, uh, nearly 10 million, billion, excuse me, ran to the region. I'm going to speak for a minute on the regional hub. Going back to infrastructure, air access, ports, road access, digital infrastructure. These are all really important if you want a diverse economy. And our economy is described as VUCA, variable, uncertain, co complex, and ambiguous, which means there are a lot of decisions in an uncertain milieu. But that's fine. We can pick projects together. And if you get a rich mix of people looking at the problem, you can slowly unpack where the levers are. And what leverage we have, because we want to leverage into being 
a hub into Africa and look at the sweet spot there. Look at the amount of growth we're going to have. We're going to leapfrog over the oil economy and go straight to renewables. We did it with, we didn't need uh, so many broadcasters. We went straight to, video, uh, straight to mobile. We've got so many ways of growing this industry and Endeavor Nigeria's report told us that will be $712 billion by 2050. Research. We have, in our country, preferred access to the European Union, to, Uni I don't even know what IFTA means, but United Kingdom, United States under AGOA, Mercurizor Limited, and uh, SADC. We also have the Southern African Customs Union, and of course, we're very excited to be part of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And this means we have better access into Africa and the world. And the A African Continental Free Trade Area will see a lot of growth if we can get the negotiations correct. And here are some great numbers about what those gains could be if we do it right. And that's why when we ask you to help us bring your points to the negotiating table, we need you to speak to your principles and get your ideas on the table. But I want to talk a little bit about innovation, what it is. And in our agency, we work across all these innovative uh, areas, including gaming and animation. And it's a rich, rich mix of digital services, ed tech, mobility, fintech. The world is digital. And we have winners. I see Glenn Gillis over there, Sea Monster, he'll be speaking later, and others. We have a lot of winners in this country and the continent. We need to celebrate them and encourage more to get pulled up and rise with the pie with everyone else. It's a wonderful place to network in Southern Africa, in Western Cape. We have these amazing events. We have a wonderful place to connect with actual incubators. I'm in one right now. There's some in the Western Cape, and we have an enabling ecosystem in the Western Cape, but also South Africa. And I'm going to get to that after I tell you what we did during COVID, which was finally to go digital as an agency. And one of those portals is the Cape Trade Portal. Trade and services companies can get their, their front door there. We vet them as reliable companies with all their due diligence done. And we are starting to match make them with global buyers who are looking for goods and services. And we are moving to a fully digital agency eventually. But now I'm going to tell you about the hard work that goes on behind all the jazzy stories. And this is very simplified. Promise you that so much is missing here. But I want to say that we do end up in a strategic plan. We do have an annual performance plan. But essentially, we have to have alignments at national to the Industrial Promotion Action Plan. At provincial, the new alignment we're working towards is the Jobs for Growth, which is so exciting and all governmental approach to change management. And my unit responds directly to DDAT, the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, which is under the um, auspice and management of the MEC of Finance and Economic Opportunities. And we do have funding from the city of Cape Town that aligns to an integrated development plan and we have the mayoral committee member for economic growth looking over us there. In my unit, that is being managed in an M&E level in these kind of key documents and logic model frameworks. And we work with lots of anacronyms, et cetera. But the good thing is you don't have to see that because what comes out of this is an operational plan that drives events like this where we can get people to start meeting and growing and working together. That is, I think, what you want to know about, is where we go, why we go, and how we do it is sort of being discussed now, but essentially, we want to be pi pivotal to growth. Events drive growth in this industry and many others, and we have business-to-business -business events aligned to that, quiet ones along the side, fan tours, and we do export readiness together with partners of those festivals. 
So coming up after Chimolagong African Digital Innovation Festival with Vitz and Faku Gesi, we have the Africa Games Week. So maybe I'll see you down there and uh, we can have uh, more discussions. But we, we're running right now four sets of African locations webinars where we look at the Western Cape and we get all the role players to tell us what changed if you want to shoot in their location. But behind the scenes, we're also networking with them and telling them the value of this industry and why they have to take up film readiness in their plans. But why festivals? And what are festivals and markets? So some are more consumer-facing, like Comic-Con. That's kind of a festival. And some are more industry-facing, like this one, Vakugesi, Digital Innovation, and Academic. And most are a bit mixed. There's a bit behind the scenes and a bit front of house. And why should I do it with my small budget and all that crazy paperwork I've got to do? Why should I come in and support? Well, it's because of the research, isn't it? It's so much great research that shows that we need to align, and all I need to do is to know that I can measure the outcomes and have an evaluated impact. To get in a little more detail, and don't worry, I'm not reading this, we really believe festivals help promote a region, increase skills, and drive foreign direct investment. And that direct investment could be an expansion of a company to also export. There is no way we could do this without linkages to associations like Animation SA, IESA, Interactive Entertainment, South Africa, SWIFT, Documentary Filmmakers, IPO, IBFC, there's so many, and they're all in my book and explained, so I don't have to go into detail. But we want to make sure strategically these events and festivals are relevant and fit into a global framework that works for industry. So where we can leverage a festival is also just with advice. Doesn't mean you have to put money in. It's really about being that advisory, that safe and trusted partner for industry to meet with. And so I'm going to use a success story. Cape Town International Animation Festival was incubated here at WITS and I didn't know that until I came up with this slide, because I kind of heard it was a traveling festival that was done by the membership-based association. At that time, and Kanda, who's now with GIZ, actually was one of the co-founders, or, or anyway, she was like pivotal in that festival and that membership-based festival. And then it moved from bits and went around the country. I think it spent time in KZN, depending where the members were working on projects. It eventually ended up in Cape Town. And they came to Westgro when I was there. And I said, great, I can, I can actually give you some money. And have you met all these people? And I, you know, they were already working with the French and so on. But, you know, we pulled in other partners. I have a three-pager of all the people in my ecosystem. So lucky for you, I only showed you the, the uh, uh, air access one because the, this ecosystem is huge. And by connecting them as an intermediary, I helped that, I believe, festival grow. And they enjoyed the experience so much. And there was a concurrent research that they did because at that time they were trying to get money from the DTIC to travel. It's called SACS. Sector Specific Assistance Scheme. I told you we do a lot of anacronyms. And they didn't qualify because they were membership based and not trade based. So, with Canda's help and others, they did research and they formed a trade body that then got to go to Annecy, Ottawa Animation Festival, and other places with sector specific support. And concurrently, they changed their name, they decided to stay plunked in Cape Town and they rebranded and it became a, such a success that in 2019 Kitaf was sold to a French company called Reed Exhibitions that do MIP, they're one of the biggest events organizations in the world and they were going to launch it in concurrent with a Comic Con which is 
So you have the industry-facing CATAF, and you have Comic-Con, which is consumer-facing, and Reed would take care of all the back end and bring money into the festival, and it was going to be fantastic, and then COVID. What? So it never happened. But what do you do in a lockdown? You do research. And so Cape Town was the lucky winner to get after research from the Reed Company, they decided they'd rather do a bigger event, bring a MIP to Africa, and they called it Fame Week. And I kind of think that South by Southwest might have inspired them, I don't know, because South by Southwest started as music, and then it went to everything digital, including film, and it, they have wellness there. It's an am amazingly big event, and I believe this will become our big event. But that's just me being I'm allowed to brag because I'm from the Western Cape and I'm supposed to brag. OK, we write brag books. OK, so but the wonderful thing is we never leave partners behind. And the Annecy Market Readiness Workshop, which we now run online, means we can actually have the market director help our our industry understand what's new in the festival and market and how to use the digital platform in the first iteration and then the hybrid versions and now how to get on the fast moving train that is animation and gaming at Annecy. And that's one example. And just look at all those amazing logos down there. Chimologong is there, IFAS, and it's just the list is huge. And those live online. So people coming up can see them now doesn't start that easy. Does the success story start with a mess? This is Miro, it's free, you know, those sticky things that you put on the wall and take pictures of. You can put it into Miro, get a concept map, question, you end up, in my case, in a PDIA format, uh, fishbone. We use that a lot, where you start with a problem that you've analyzed from a big mess, and then you've got a problem statement, you work backwards between these spokes, and you find areas where you might decide to find a lever for that problem. Doesn't mean you're going to do them all. You want one that works for your region. And our big statement now is to leverage a more capable and sustainable screen tech industry in Western Cape, South Africa. And these are some of the, the, the areas of constraint. The changing regulatory environment that lacks a strong regional voice. Well, we can't do much there. It's red and yellow. There's not much we can do. We can have conversations behind the scenes. But where there's green, possibly we can make choices to leverage those. But we certainly can help have those discussions with people. And the corruption angle there is just because we had to mention it, we have to make a positive story, and I think Zondo, et cetera, is positive. What came out of one of those fish bones was the answer to the visas, which we've been part of behind the scenes since 2014 when the legislation changed. And our industry got very angry. It nearly collapsed the short film industry, which includes commercials and stills. And essentially, when the legislation from the Department of Home Affairs and national mandate changed, industry couldn't apply in time. Long form could barely manage it but not short form, and season was coming. So Westgro got those discussions happening behind the scenes, but they didn't go anywhere. And as soon as there's the discussion, a whiff of, we might need to go to a lawsuit, we have to step back, because Westgro is not allowed to be seen to be fighting in a legal sense. It's not our mandate. We have to play nice. Behind the scenes, we can have tough conversations, but we can't do it when there's a chance of legal issues. There was a very amicable result. By December 2014, Fiverr grew. Film industry visa assistance. Film industry has a special deviation to get visas very quickly. It's a QR coded letter, and there's actually other things that have come since then. We have whole hour sessions on what this is on our website. You can hear it from the CEO's mouth. But what we did with our fishbone during lockdown was figure out how to spend some money to support 50 more companies to join. There's a joining fee, and then there's a per letter fee. And um, I'm hoping other provinces also support their regional producers to join, because it really does help them move fast. 
Other things we do, as I mentioned, these books, we have a brag book literally in the Filmmaker's Guide to the Western Cape. We have to celebrate all the national bodies, animation, SA, etc. And they're all told about in there, and that gets updated every year as a private-public partnership. There are ads in it, and um, we're in the next iteration. There is also a directory in there, which we are allowed to do in a poppy environment, whereas before, all the other databases had to be collapsed until they were cleaned. And we have this amazing book, which if you ever shoot in the Western Cape, don't forget to tell us where you sh that you shot that film, and we can put the film's name in here, or the commercial, and then maybe uh, a good researcher can find your company, because your name will be in there forever. So I talked about research. What do we do as Western Cape for research? Well, 2017, we did do this tomb of a sector study, and there are recommendations and findings from those that we are activating. And the city of Cape Town is activating many of them. They've already got a great website. They have spoken about how their film office needs expanding because they're so busy, and they've done that, and they've just had a really good amount of stepping in the right direction. But getting a film fund is difficult. But I trust them because they did it for events. Now, quite often, mandate holders think of as events as the same as film, but they're not. An event is public. A film project is a mini uh, intangible asset manufacturing company setting up and leaving. In fact, the road is no longer a road. It is a set. The car that's on there is no longer a car. It's a movable asset. So we really have to recognize that laws that govern cars, roads, and events aren't really the same. So we're helping with film readiness, understanding that across the region, but the city knows that already. They are moving very fast, and they are getting a fund. They subvent events already to nearly 80 million rand a year. That's how they attract so many big events. They're promising uh, small, amount to begin with to prove to their principals, the politicians, that this industry deserves subvention and then they'll hopefully grow it to a similar level. Other, other projects of research, we're very excited to have taken part in the For the Win, Chimolagong-led gaming research. We have Dash Techs that were funded by the province and of course we work with the um, Global Best Practice and our National Film and Video Foundation and we are working with all the policy that comes out of our country. I want to especially thank UNESCO for doing the African film industry research. And Netflix and SAA, SA Tourism did research during lockdown on film-induced tourism. And I just want to say that when anybody does anything well, we should write about it. And I want to say Disney did a great job with Kiazimoto and there's another kind of research. I'm putting it here because I want you to think about research. People who like something are kind of like researchers saying this business model works. It's the TikTokification of content. What's good content? What's bad content? Right now, you go to a broadcaster and they can say, it kind of looks like uh, Raised by Wolves and meets Game of Thrones, you know, or, you know, and they look at what it did in the past. And so it, when HBO Max didn't renew Warrior se after season two, we were all very hurt. It was shooting in the Western Cape, big project. But with 70,000 signatures from fans, I think uh, they, they maybe listened. And when Warner bought Discovery, HBO Max, they greenlit it. So I'm hoping that we'll get Raised by Wolves back. We're nearly at 25,000 signatures, so do sign. We're trying to get that. I love that show. I'm a big fan of Sir Ridley Scott. Back to film-induced tourism and what it is. Well, Netflix and SAT measured three properties. Seriously Single, shot here in Joburg. Blood and Water, shot in... Um, Cape Town as a TV series and My Octopus Teacher feature documentary. The 
my octopus teacher, drove 71% more engagement with the idea of doing adventure tourism in South Africa. Doesn't mean they're going to swim in the kelp like me every weekend. Blood and Water encouraged youth to come and see South Africa for all the cultural assets. They were more interested in culture after having watched Blood and Water. And the seriously single people wanted to just come to Joburg and party, essentially. You can read it on their website. Dylan, please help me. What's up, fam? What's happening? I'm going to speak over it. No, I want to go. Actually, these are the two stars. Well, isn't this dangerous? Eh? Star system. How are you? These are two oh. amazing stars of blood and water. Oh, yo, yo. And they're playing in front of the Zeitz Mocha. Has anybody been to the Zeitz Mocha? It's a beautiful museum in Yama. And it's one of the most beautiful stars in the world. And it's full of art. It's the red back of the silo that You guys and my co-star Amma on a personal tour of Cape Town, the city that has moved. From the ocean views to the mountain views to the food and the fashion scene, the mother city has I was made in Africa. This is my story. This is my life. This is my city, Cape Town. I gotta make it just for my kids and for their kids as kids. That's 12 years and years. Promise my brother as soon as he out to finish this bid. We finna do it bigger than anybody ever did. The odds is real big. Job that's real big. Say trying a little. My God is real big. Stayed up on the ground and the cars is real big. I gotta do it big. The only way that I can live. And I Tourism. One of the most important... Finish. Sorry. This one does need sound with um, the work that we're going to be going forward in. I'm about to take questions, but you're going to watch an innovation in tourism marketing, which we're winning lorries for. So I think this will play now. Let me just go. Dylan, please help me. <laughs> what's up, fam? What's up? Let's get into Roblox. Yay! come and experience it. We live in the Cape Floral Kingdom and they learn about the flowers and the indigenous animals. Okay, so I want to leave, uh, lead this questioning off is where do you think you'll be in 2035? Are you planning for that? So we are planning for pockets of the future that are embedded in the present 
and hoping to, to land a future that is better for all. Otherwise, we could be in one of these other event horizons. And this and many other graphs are what are being used in our growth for jobs strategy. But it's discussion to you. I think we need our Tumi with a Y back to help with questions. So like many intermediaries, I'm also playing the role of, you know, getting my chair here, getting you back here so we can have um, a quick conversation. Um, and just to apologize to everybody who's joining online, I know that um, I think the sound cut, so we'll try and share the link to all the videos that you um, have shared today. Thank you so much, Monica. That, that is so comprehensive and so detailed. I was thinking, who's doing all that work? <laughs> and how big is your team? Because <laughs> that was quite a lot. And I know that there's quite a lot of questions also that have come um, while you were sharing your, your keynote address. Um, so what we'll do is we'll uh, take those three questions um, and then we will open up to the audience that is here present. I'll go straight into the first one. Um, and that is from... Smilo Kosa, a uh, first question uh, is, does Westgro work with Southern South African film and TV guilds as well? So do you work with guilds? We work with the, all the... Uh South African Guild of Editors, uh, SASFED, which is an a federation of uh, associations and guilds. So. We try to work with all of them. And as anyone who touches this industry and who can help make a more facilitating and enabling environment, we try to work with them all. And in industry, it, just like our board, yeah. we have a private board. My goal is to eventually have an, an, a, an association possibly represent industry on our board. That would be cool. Yeah, that, that would be really cool. And I think one of the things you were speaking about was this brag sheet or this brag book, right? Um, and I think it came up in the, in the report as well, just the, the value and role of story, us being able to tell the story of the work that we do. How are you navigating that? And, you know, with the boards, with governments, with different types of, or rather with other sectors who might not necessarily understand what this is all about or why you are excited. Well, actually, I'd like to brag about Pioneers, which is a new property from our comms team, and it's going evergreen. So it's a digital magazine. Um, they do print a few copies, but in the end, we want it to live online and generate content because we are in the age of content. And it's all about bragging. They're making films about the people that they've done in-depth interviews on. Health tech has been a big part of that. And I think um, there's a huge digital footprint in the health tech sector. So. Uh, AR, VR is being used for training, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're getting virtual um, diagnoses. So all of those innovators are in our magazine called Pioneers. And in fact, Westgrove Film and Media has been invited to do a Pioneers um, campaign and fill one book. And uh, as soon as we can get it in our strategy, I, I'm looking forward to being part of that success story. And bragging is a good thing to do when it's about someone else, especially somebody who's very humble. Quite often, these are professors who've been churning out PhDs who go on to develop patents, and we need to brag about them. For instance, Kustus in the Stellenbosch University in, you know, stage, they've just finally patented their watermarking of PDFs. They've been very much in the anti-piracy for movies where they embed Bitcoin-like features into film so that if you send a screener to a reviewer and it gets out there, they are responsible for that leak. So, and, and it's mine, so we can find, they can find it instantly when it's gone online. Okay, that sounds really interesting. They came to Annecy, actually, way back, because it is all about connecting innovation to industry, even if it comes out of uh, an a UC, uh, a IT kind of hub. They need to find a market, and the industry has to merge. Sure. Yeah, I agree. And, 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 and I, you know, there's another question here from uh, Jabril Dream who's now asking, you know, around those exchanges, around those merging and the connections, how do you think Senegal, for example, which is a country of cinema, could link to South Africa for exchange programs, et cetera? 
Well, I think Senegal's in the room, so I wouldn't want to, to <laughs> hog the limelight there. But uh, yeah, well, Africa is welcome to all these events, and they do come. And we do meet them overseas. That's why we go to Annecy. You saw our festival schedule, South by Southwest, very large African diaspora in America, and Africans <coughs> going there, so like my colleague Lisa. Lisa. And, and we do, we do go into go Africa, Africa for our Africa Africa trade, trade desk. desk. Um, um, Michael Gallo uh, uh, is a brilliant is ambassador, a brilliant ambassador for, for our country. Uh, and uh, he brings our filmmakers or our industry representatives into market to take those B2B meetings. He goes to Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, yeah. So it's a yes, let's do it. Yes. Um, and let's see how, you know, we can uh, have that conversation with the people who live in those countries uh, who are here today as well. I'd like to open up uh, to the guests joining us here in Johannesburg. I think we have one roving mic. If you do have a question, we'll take three at a time. Um, any comments as well, it doesn't have to be a question. It can be a provocation, it can be a challenge. Because when you were saying we do go to Africa, I was like, but we are already in Africa. <laughs> so just really how we see ourselves as well in relation to the uh, rest of the continent. Yes, the rest of Africa, I have to say that. <laughs> because we really want to position ourselves as a gateway to Africa, from Africa, as Western Cape. I mean, that's a bit of a brag. But we have to make a problem statement how to become a globally leading regional economy. And when you're on a continent like this that's so rich, the opportunities are huge and you want to be fast there. And there's a lot of countries that are very much in front of Southern Africa and we need to catch up. And likewise, you know, people are watching us. We do exchanges between TIPAs. We compare best practice. We send our executives to, to understand how other places work and then take back best practice and vice versa. We're always open to those exchanges. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. David, I think there's, there's a question brewing, but while you think about your question, there's another one from uh, the online space. How do you think we can make more children and young adults involved as maker-creator intermediaries, seeing that they're using difficult coding with bottlenecks that do not allow them uh, to complete their projects after receiving training in coding, AI, etc.? Wow, that's a great one. Um, we did have a beautiful panel on that yesterday, so I would encourage everyone to watch these sessions online. But from a Western Cape perspective, we did look at infrastructure early on, and, and film had to wait its turn while they put in uh, high-speed Wi-Fi everywhere they could, and, and trunks of fiber. And we landed three cables, the most recent one a few months ago. So we have high-speed, and now we have um, Star, Starlink with Elon's team. Mm -hmm. So. I think what we have to do is roll out free data for all, or very free-ish data, or freemium data, so that there aren't these bottlenecks, because it is, it is a resource, like air, clean air, clean water. We have to give data access and the technology. Luckily, the phones are getting smarter, so that's helping. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think there is a question at the back and another one here in front. I don't think your mic is working, so I don't mind giving you mine. Yeah, I'll give you mine. Perhaps also your name uh, before the question. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Monica. My name is Dimitri Martinez. Um, I, I wanted to find out the, the companies that are coming out to shoot uh, using local locations and so on. Are they also spending, um, uh, are they also doing their post production here? or? Um, it, it does it tend to be just the locations and then doing the post, post work back in whatever the home country is? That's an interesting question. Um, 
So we have a, a mixed bag of that. So uh, from what I understand from the French co-production spinners, uh, their producers doing everything here as much as possible. But uh, yeah, obviously there has to be an exchange to make an official co-production, so perhaps they're doing some, some posts back home. But in the end, um, it's a cost thing. And if you've hit the cap on your incentive, it might make more sense to go to another territory to do some of the post if, if you're getting an incentive there for post-production. And some countries like Canada have really split the post incentives to make it attractive or even regions like New York or uh, Georgia uh, have, you know, state kind of incentives. So we are globally competitive. Um, SBI Goldberg just released their global uh, incentives and you can look at everything. We're up against Mauritius in Africa etc. We, we, we are not uh, the best in the world just because we live in a beautiful place and have great crew and talent. It is about the bottom dollar and has to be cost effective to come in. Something I didn't mention is that we are very green as well. We're going more green. We, we, all our big productions are, have to be certified to a level that matches like Albert or the other ones so that we can be shown on those uh, broadcasters because they're no longer allowed to be this big carbon sink. So there's money all along the value chain, even if you're growing a crop to sink carbon. So our farmers are in the value chain, the hospitality is in the value chain, the locations are in the value chain, the, 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 the stunt people, uh, the props, the art department, there's so much in the value chain. But post is, is amazing because it can go anywhere and that's a huge opportunity for all the creators in Africa. All right, thank you so much. There's also a question from Kanda. Thank you. Um, thanks, Monica. I just also wanted to touch a little bit on uh, what sort of demand you're seeing because you're uh, also interfacing with a lot of the international industry who come in to uh, ask Westgro about uh, opportunities. Um, so I'm interested, the Western Cape has primarily, um, from what I know, been a service destination. Um, is there, are you seeing an increase in requests for original IP to find content creators? So I think everybody who's starting a company needs to develop their own IP and I think Glenn will be talking a lot about that later because without IP you're not going to have an amortized income for your growth of your company. So a studio model depends on owning the IP. When you go to a tourism site in America like NBC Universals, they own all that IP or they license that IP to make a tourism attraction but that's not their main business. Disney, the parks isn't their main business. It's making the film, filling the channels, and driving the merchandising ecosystem around that. So we encourage it where it's possible, but it's very expensive to create some projects. So unfortunately, people might sell rights to some of their projects eventually just to get it made. You know, we're not in those discussions. But um, I also want to talk about reality TV because you know, there are formats that go global. We have some in the Western Cape, you know, the Love Islands or the Survivors. And those are great for crew to get experience on, but we also sell format. And we have companies that specialize in format. I believe Trace Studios, who's one of the, the, the Fakugesi um, uh, sponsors, and they, they've just launched an online free uh, educating um, app. So, I mean, they're really innovative and they are, uh, they bought Okushla Studio who did formats, uh, you know, as their bread and butter. And I remember one of their directors, she told me it took seven years for her to develop her own format, which she could then sell at MIP. And then it, she got it down to two years development to sale, development to sale. So they'd make the format here and then sell the format for the world. So it really is, sometimes you only own that backbone of a format, but we need everyone to find a property that they can develop. And, and I encourage people, especially youth, 
to start testing with the market. Like those 70,000 signatures don't come from nowhere. They come from people who love a property and you can start a property on YouTube in a podcast. You can start it, you know, as a comic book, as a novel. There are so many ways to own your IP. And once you own that IP as a base, then there's different ways to sell it. And once it becomes a property, then maybe you've had to, to chisel your ownership to a certain smaller piece of it. But it doesn't mean that you don't own it. Shine, what would you say are some of the barriers to that? I think we were speaking about that last week in, in the workshop, right? Like, people just don't know how to do that, how to own um, their own IP or leverage it or monetize, right? Like, what are some of the barriers that you're noticing, especially at a creator individual level? Well, I think attending market upskillings is, is one way because you learn from people who've done it before. People are always paying it forward and helping out and pulling people up. And for instance, did you know that if you publish a book, it belongs to you? It is your IP, but until you publish it, someone, and you talk about it at a bar, someone might write the similar story. But you don't own it until you've put it on paper and, and, and got it out there in some form. So, so get it concretized, an idea in the mind or in the story, until you write it and publish it in some form, it doesn't belong to you. And those tricks are easier to understand when you see people in front of you. Um, I know the Triggerfish team incubated sort of a coffee night, and they, two, two of them, I think they ended up in Digital Lab Africa, they went to Annecy, and by that time, no one was listening to their story or their pitch. They did a whole comic book, which is now published. And now the TV series is coming out of that animation, I think. So, so the story can go in many directions. But the main thing is to get the creative work concretized in some form. Sure. All right. Thank you. We have a question, another one from Smilo. Um, they are asking, how's the likelihood of partnerships with, like, with the likes of film and technology brands like Dolby partnering with you and fostering talent for our show, our show in production matching, or maybe even superseding global, moving sta uh, global movie standards? Well, that's a very technical question, and I would have invited an industry expert up on stage. <laughs> I saw a sound expert here, Sound in Motion, the other day, um, and there's a few others. Um, but uh, Dolby is a whole, a whole thing. Um, Dolby Atmos, yeah. So, so I'll just get away from that and go a bit higher. Uh, studios do partner, and uh, telcos <coughs> partner, and <coughs> brands like um, the 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 those wonderful tablets that are always supporting Cape Town International Animation Festival. Wacom, Wacom. Wacom. So they, there are partnerships. I think you need to find a brand match and you need to find a way to help them understand your constraint and how you're gonna solve that problem for them. There were many people on the incubator panels here who have done it. I mean, Chimologon itself has so many brands supporting them. And yeah, I, I mean, it's a natural fit. We do have corporate CSI in Southern Africa. Maybe it's a, it's a global thing where you give back. CSI is something that we all need to spend money on appropriately, and I think this industry knows how to spend money. <laughs> this is true. We have two more questions. Um, oh, the first one is here. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Monica, for your presentation. Very exciting, very engaging, and creative presentation. Um, my question is in two questions, two parts. Um, for me, I, I like what you said about the uh, copywriting your stuff as a comic book and all that. I, I did that. Uh, most of my ideas started as comic books. And um, currently, right now, one of them is actually being developed into a TV series with a partner in, um, in France. And one of the challenges we're having is production. You know, so when I watched the videos you played, I was like, oh, OK, wow. It would be nice to probably shoot in South Africa. You know? But then, how do you think um, I will be able to convince my partners to actually not shoot in Nigeria, probably, and come to South Africa? What are those ready hand on incentives that you think might make them jump on? Because we are currently having problems securing the funds to actually shoot the eight episode series. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, um, 
What does copywriting look like here? And what do you think makes it different from other African countries? Oh, two really great questions. So I think we have an answer to the first one with the example again of Spinners, which is a co-production between France, your partner country, and South Africa. And it is official. So that's a huge win. And I think we have experts at the uh, embassy who can talk you through the French aspects of the French treaty. And then when you're ready, and you find you do have to find a local partner. So Spinners found um, uh, Natives at Large, which is a very established, global, globally relevant South African studio based in Joburg. And Ramadan Suleiman, the co-founder, was here speaking with Joachim Landau from the French studio. And it was just a lovely partnership. So if a co-production works and it's official, you get more money from our state and from the state in France, and you get access to markets, and visas are slightly easier, and and end. So there's a lot of wins there, especially if you've got an established partner in France, they might be able to access even more money if it's official. So I would aim for that if it's an expensive project. If you don't hit the target, if the numbers aren't, you could just come in as a service job. There are some incentives on, in on service jobs, which is why we get so many service jobs like Warrior, shooting in Cape Town now, season three. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee, so uh, his granddaughter resurrected that, and it's just an amazing series. And if you ever want to impress your partners on, in terms of technical skill in fighting, watch that film. We have all the talent here, and stunts. But um, your second question on IP is a contested space. I am not um, a lawyer but I have been in industry meetings where there is a contestation in that part of the fishbone, changing regulation. Our IP legislation has to be updated in this country. It is, uh, is at risk, according to some. It is a bonus, according to others. We don't know uh, what's going to be the final outcome. It has been sent back once by the president uh, on constitutional grounds. And just because there are conflicts between um, uh, uh, technical terms like um, uh, for fair dealing and fair use. I mean, I'm saying these things and I have no idea what they mean, but they, apparently they conflicted. We do have experts in the room I could introduce you to and you could talk about that. It has caused some flight risk for companies here, but uh, it, it's not a problem in the short term. We just need to see the final legislation if it's going to be a problem in the, in the long term. So again, West Grove's happy, promoting, come. We're all about get you making things here now, and your story will go to the right place in the country. There are extra funds here in Hauteng, ECDC, the e Economic Development Corporation of uh, Eastern Cape has extra money, and of course, KwaZulu-Natal Film Commission is doing a great job. So, there's extra pots of money depending on who you partner with. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question at the back. Hi, um, my name is Alex. I live in Cape Town, but I work for a Johannesburg-based company, 24-Bit Games, as a producer there. Um, my experience in Cape Town is it's all about film, the film industry, and I get that because there's the tourism component, so I get that there's the drive to push for the film industry. But how can we get the video game industry sort of at the same level as the treatment towards the film industry? And how can we get local studios considered for trade missions and things like that? Great questions. And um, yeah, you're very young. Um, so you, don't, you weren't living in that kind of golden period that I spoke about when Kanda managed to switch Animation SA to be recognized as a trade body and to go overseas. And AISA, Interactive Entertainment SA, I think managed one before the legislation changed. So there is no money at national. You can apply to the NFEF, and if you qualify, you could do two trips a year with a bit of support to get to market. They did go to Annecy, and they supported quite a few producers like yourself. And the other way to do it is to get your project into pitches, like uh, the Annecy, the Road to Annecy pitch is coming up. So that's just for that part of the question. The other part of the question is, I thought we were supporting the whole ecosystem of film in the Western Cape. So 
my colleague, my unit's name was called Film Promotion, but now it's actually Film and Media Promotion, kind of changing to creative industries with a focus on film and media. The reason the end media is there is because we want to state unequivocally that we support the whole value chain of production, from gaming right through to post-production, right through to whatever's coming next. It's screen tech, technically. So we do support the Cape Town International Animation Festival. Comic Con is coming. There, there's chances to meet. There's um, maker days. There's, you know, people are supporting each other in these weekly meetups. And, you know, we're trying to find ways to support what we can within our mandate, which is quite technically a business focus. But I think this industry and your industry in particular need capacity. So you have to do more of those open house, get the students interested, drive capacity there. And I'm sorry you're not feeling love, but we have done work at that level when we had money available for those kinds of projects. But um, we're going to keep trying. The city of Cape Town took over the screen tech um, outputs, and they are doing with Loudhaler, so Google Loudhaler, kind of monthly or bi-monthly meetups at an industry level. And that's also a chance. Like, I met the people behind the app. Has anybody ordered from Checkers? Checkers is a local supermarket, and that 60, minute, 60 items in 60, second, or 60 minutes was a new app for us and, uh, during lockdown. It was sort of a lifesaver for many of us. And it's a very convenient app. And I met those app developers in that meetup, one of the meetups that are following the screen tech recommendations. And I think that the magic that happens at those meetups is seminal because you suddenly realize that in the back pocket of that creative developer is this other project which you could support, perhaps. So you, maybe you don't have to travel. Maybe you just need to go to a monthly meetup, you know? And, and I do know that some people are still meeting in, uh, you know, once a month on Zoom and having a glass of wine together because they've made friends globally during like Berlinale and others that, you know, we had to sit here, but we still had to go overseas. So. So try to get into some of those as well. Somebody else or some spaces that also feel unloved um, <laughs> outside of kind of the big cities, Durban, Johannesburg, Cape Town. What would you say uh, are some of the strategies in which we can activate so a similar kind of, um, you know, hub um, in other provinces here in South Africa? Like I'm listening to you and I'm like, oh my goodness, this sounds like a, a Durban or Joburg or Cape Town thing, but what about, you know, uh, Tabanchu, the Free State, other provinces, how can they unlock, you know, not, not, not necessarily something similar or the same, but really building an appreciation for, for, for the tech space? Sure. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons that I uh, was invited to, to do this as a, as a case study is to show how we did it and are doing it and are planning into the future. So each region has to consider who are the players. They have to map their ecosystem. It's probably three pages in every province's ecosystem because we have national, international, regional, local, and there's constraints between them. If there's a mandate for permits here and they're not talking to the film office there, or you know, like if the asset minder isn't talking properly, then maybe that's a place where they can leverage some, some nice conversations behind the scenes. We're doing a lot of it online, so we don't have to travel as much. And of course, all our upskillings are now online as much as possible, so they could, the, the youth or whoever needs to be upskilled can watch like the road to Annecy is living online. And they are so inspirational because you have Animation SA with the road to Annecy and all of the winners there talking about how they prepared their pitch and then you can watch the final pitches and hear from the jury and there's just so much going on. You need to plan your year ahead and look at where you might go and then do those research, the, the research and then find out how you're being supported. And I do have to applaud the National Film and Video Foundation, an agency of our Department of Sports, Arts and Culture because they do roadshows to all the provinces 
and that's when those tougher questions can also be asked. All right, thank you so much. Um, all right, there's maybe one or two last questions before yeah. we close. Um, fantastic presentation. Mike Strano from Yakwetu in Kenya. Um, I just love the idea, you know, gaming is uh, bigger globally than music and film added together. So I love the idea of play before you stay. Um, it's genius. I just want to know what was the thought process on getting there and what was the secret behind getting to that idea? I, I think it has something to do with research and then also the, the fishbone. Yes? So um, I'm feeling very proud of our comms team right now. So we have a, a flat hierarchy and we have a team that specialize in comms and they have a lot of money to spend because we are a promotion agency. They give some of us some money to us. You saw the love there in our minute and a half of glory, and they won us a golden dolphin for it, and I personally love that. And um, they do that for all the different parts. So when they came to tourism, the thought leadership was out of this world during COVID. We did an app in the beginning to put people to sleep and help them dream of one day coming to our region. And that app, which put you to sleep, because remember how scared we all were. We, weren't, we were, had anxiety, we weren't sleeping. That also won awards. It's still out there, you can find it. So this sort of came out of that research of what is happening next. And when they have research, what they do is they pitch that research to our principals and they say, we want to spend this chunk of money it's belonging in this part of our budget, and, but it's new. Are you okay with that? Because we're moving parts of the old budget, maybe Facebook boosting, which we still do, but into, into this new project. But they have to produce content, so why not make a different content? And right now, another project that's winning a lot of m accolades and is running out with boosting to North America is our never-ending tourist, which I didn't include because I had half an hour. And I didn't want to put one more video in there, but you can watch them online. And they did first the UK with boosting, and what they did is just met people who, when they came here, never left, never left. They let, they went home, they moved their business, they did it all legally. And other, and then they came to Holland, which was, and again, research said which country. So Holland, one of our big export target markets. Then we did never-ending tours for Holland, and now we're doing the USA. But when the research came up for children, I think, I mean, it was the very first, I mean, r literally first in the world. So that thinking comes from that department and from King James. So every three years, we have to hire a, a top branding company, and King James won the tender. And they also hire other companies because they can't do it all. So the feed goes through, and I think they hired a great team who listened to us when we told them what our industry meant and we helped club together all of that footage so that they could put it into a story for us. So yeah, hiring a good comms team that puts value for money on there and makes it work is, so obviously they didn't make the game, they hired a company that does gaming, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, it's 12 o'clock, but I'd like to steal just one minute. Um, there's a question from the Zoom. Um, Van Staden or Van Staden says, I'm interested in hearing what, if any, ideas are being incubated to get the music industry involved. From independent studios to entertainment spectacles at bigger corporate events. Yeah, so again, eventing is more uh, a different thing. It is very well funded by the city of Cape Town, and we have a convention bureau that attracts seven years in advance, big conventions. You know, 30,000 people for ophthalmologists or you know, a gynecologist convention or a space convention. And, you know, those are a little bit smaller, I guess. But um, we want those conventions. That's why we have about 80 million rand in the subvention funds at the city of Cape Town, which is a number I heard at Fame Week Africa from the mayoral committee member for safety and security who's in charge of that budget. And he uh, specifically spoke to the fact that he's hoping eventually he'll get enough budget for film. But, but the eventing is where f music is. We used to have a, a jazz festival in Cape Town that used a lot of that money. Um, other events, I know awesome 
uh, no, WOMAD was just in Cape Town and used some inventing money. So the money is there, and Musiki Africa is at Fame Week Africa, so I think those conversations will happen at that Fame Week Africa. Sure. Thank you so much, Monica. That was quite uh, insightful. If we can please give a big, big round of applause. Um, key for me is that role of research evidence, you know, an evidence um, uh, approach to innovation. The role of, you know, um, champions who understand the value of the work that we're doing and who are able then to package it in a story that allows different sectors, different players to understand it, to resource it, to support it, and to invest in it. So um, thank you so much. We're going to go into our lunch break now. Thank you so much. Um, I have been told that people have received different types of vouchers vouchers for their lunch. Um, trust me, I had nothing to do with it, um, but I know that people who, or I've been told that people who have numbers one to four uh, should get their food at the coffee shop inside Simulokong, and those with vouchers starting or beginning five to seven should get their food at the food truck. I think the food truck is outside. We will be returning at one o'clock for our panel discussion, um, so if guests can come back at least by... What, 12.59, 12.58? So we can start promptly at 1 o'clock. Remember to share your comments, your questions, your provocations on our uh, different social media platforms. Our hashtag is hashtag Fagu 2022. I will see you after the break. Dangi.
Hungry? Me too. Go to the Huawei App Gallery and you will find... Find Uber Eats, Mr.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Can I see by just by a show of hands if you enjoyed lunch, if you were able to chat to a few people? I did notice some people stuck to the people they came here with. And so just to help us, you know, digest the food, the burgers and the Cokes, um, I'm going to invite you to stand up on your feet, leave your laptop, your pen, your paper, and find one person in the room you have not spoken to today. 
share a little bit about who you are briefly, <laughs> and maybe a comment, a question, something that's brewing um, from the first discussion. I'll give you another minute, just one more minute. Yeah, I'm a 3D animator, and yeah, basically that um, I'm striving to be a generalist for now because I don't really know uh, what I want to pursue, but uh, I think 3D animator. If you can start wrapping up. 30 more seconds. about who you've met, what how they've challenged you, um, and what common you know, qualities or interests you might have with these new strangers you've met. I also encourage the people who are online to do the same um, in those breakout rooms as well as in the chat. All right, without wasting any more time, we're going to go into our first panel discussion for uh, this forum. Um, yeah, in this question, in this session, we are asking, you know, looking at ac actions, tensions, and assumptions in the digital creative industries in Africa. Um, we're asking the big question: the why we do the work that we do, who we do it for, who are we serving, and where in the larger ecosystem are we doing that? Further to that, I'd like to ask: what is the exit strategy? Right? Um, what is the relevance of the intermediary? Um, if we're really wanting to equip, empower, enable, um, what does it look like for us to not be needed anymore? But right now we are, and we would like to hear a little bit about what that looks like. What are some of the suggestions, the expectations, the challenges, the tensions, especially in relation to the role of governments um, across you know, the ecosystem. We're also asking ourselves, how do the underground intermediaries negotiate this landscape and how do they find support as well? So we have a panel of five really interesting representatives from government, from the private sector, from the creative sector, people who sit uh, in between, and we'll hear a little bit about what that looks like for them. The 
you know, recommendation or the request is for each panel to kind of give us an overview of how they are defining their work, how are they defining themselves as an intermediary, where in the larger ecosystem do they find themselves? Um, and most importantly then, what are some of those kinks those challenges and tensions that they experience on a daily. I'd like to call on stage um, Ayodele Elegba, Glenn Gillis, Nafi Sise, Ndombi Makoetu, and Ojoma Ochai, who is joining us online. Let's welcome on stage. Let's, let's welcome them with a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> One of the reasons why we're so tight is because we are filming, so we need to make sure that we are in the frame. Um, I'd like to also request that you fill in the um, attendance register, particularly because they will be taking some pictures of all of us here, and they need consent for us, uh, for them to be able to share this content online. How are you all feeling? Welcome, welcome, welcome. I know some people flew in over the weekend. <laughs> welcome, really, really, really excited. Um, yeah, let's start with you, Ayodele Elegba. I'm going to quickly read your bio. Um, you already started giving us some insights around the work that you do in Nigeria, some of the challenges, and even some of the recommendations and suggestions on how better uh, we can do this work. Um, so to kick us off, I'd like to introduce the Managing Director of Spoof Media Limited and Lagos Comic Con. He's popularly known as the Dream Maker and is famous for creating and writing some of the top comic books um, and, and animation franchises in Africa. Um, over a decade of writing comics and feature films in Nollywood, Ayodele moved into creating, writing, and producing animation as well. Um, again, an overview of the work that you do, some of the tensions and challenges, um, and yeah, your role and how you are defining yourself as an intermediary. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Ayo, and um, I, I think I would say I'm an intermediary because of the work I do in terms of Lagos Comic Con and working with young people uh, generally. Um, I've, been, I've been doing intermediary work for like uh, 10 or 15 years now. Um, started with just um, training young kids, you know, at my backyard you know, how to draw, how to make comic books, how to animate. Uh, and then the passion grew to start Lagos Comic Con, which was a bigger platform, um, where we started bringing um, creators from all around Nigeria to come and actually showcase their work. Because when I began that, I, I realized that there was no, no platform, no, no, no medium, you know, for creative people to actually express themselves. You know, unlike South Africa that has a rich culture of arts and stuff, uh, over there, there wasn't much like that. So I, I needed to create a space where um, creators could actually um, showcase their work and actually show representation, you know, outside of Nigeria. And we did the first one, and it was so successful. Um, 300 creative people came from all over Nigeria, and they, they showed that there was an industry, there was something there, you know. Um, and we've, we've grown, we've worked with creators. I was mentioning on Friday um, how we've been able to develop and in quotes, incubate some big stars that we have right now, uh, like Kugali, who is currently doing stuff with Disney, like Comic Republic, and some other you know, um, <coughs> upcoming studios that are really uh, coming up now. So it, it gives me great pleasure. Uh, the challenges I think I've faced over the time has been um, really communicating my role as an intermediary to them and being able to really know what exactly uh, I should do to help their work um, get better and to make them succeed. And one of the things that we are trying to do now, which I was discussing with some of my teammates, was that um, um, we need to set up like a hub of some sorts, um, a space where, um, because getting access to equipment is also a very huge problem. You know, so imagine having a hub where you could actually come in, have computers. I, I like what you guys are doing here. It's, it's awesome. I'm getting inspiration. You know, I'm, I'm going back trying to do something similar. You know, it's, it's really awesome. So um, in a nutshell, that's what I do. And recently, we just founded uh, RenderCon, uh, which is like an animation, international animation festival, where um, animators can actually show their um, animation on a big cinema screen. So we've gotten partnership with a cinema house in Lagos. We have a five-day event where we are screening African content, African animation, and bringing speakers to talk about what they do and how 
uh, we can expand um, the industry. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I am okay indeed. I'm trying to multitask. It's not happening. Let's please give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Apologies. I'm trying to capture all the insights and, you know, yeah. But uh, thank you. Let's move over to you, uh, Sis uh, Dombi. Um, again, the same question, some of the tensions, how you're defining your role as an intermediary. I think you're one of the only people who come um, from the government uh, perspective, so a little bit, um, uh, yeah, a little your insights and perspectives of what that looks like for you currently. Thank you very much. Probably the one with the um, least exciting job around <laughs> the panel here. <laughs> Yeah, as I said, I'm from the department. Actually, no, I made a mistake. I know why you were looking at me. I need to read your, pri your bio properly. <laughs> like one liner when she's done so much work. Uh, Osis Ntombi is Acting Chief Director for Broadcasting Policy and Creative Industries in the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies. Makwete has been instrumental in the development of the Creative Industries Plan approved by uh, Cabinet for the Audiovisual Interactive Media Subsector. Interesting that it's not Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. Um, I'm really interested to hear more about your Th work. Thank you very much. Actually, just a disclaimer, it is indeed um, led by the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, and the Department of Communications, Small Business Development, Trade and Industry, who are actually part of the task team that um, has been driving the Creative Industries Master Plan. So it is not really the, the, the project of the Department of Communications. I thought it was important that I, I put that out there. Now, when it comes to my department, um, our role is to actually come up with policies, um, legislations, and strategies in terms of digital transformation in South Africa. So we are tasked to make sure that we come up with that digital transformation, but in make sure as well that um, there's digital inclusion. Mm. And some of you, I'm sure you are aware that in the country there is a lot of digital divide. So as a department, we are responsible to make sure that we close the digital divide. The other important work that we've done as a department is to come up with the 4IR report, which has just been um, published, I think, around um, May uh, 2022, if I'm not mistaken, where it is actually a blueprint in terms of how, as a country, we need to move to the 4IR. That I important project that we do as a department. We are in the process of developing a white paper on audio and audiovisual uh, content services, which actually links quite well with the creative industries. So we are also responsible for that as the department. Now, in terms of the challenges that we have, I think one is, what is one that I've just highlighted, the issue around digital divide, where we need to make sure that there is access to infrastructure. And a point that um, uh, Monica raised to say we need to make sure that there is indeed access to data given the fact that data is now found in different uh, platforms so we have to make sure that people have access to data so that they can access uh, uh, creative content mm -hmm. uh, online as well so I do want to say that probably one of the or the strengths that we have as a department is really to make sure that we create a conducive environment, um, including the creative industry sector for that matter, because we do play a role through the SAPC, we play a role through the regulator, which is ICASA, we also play a role through Centec, which is one of the um, uh, signal distributors in the country. The other exciting project that I want to um, share with you here is that as through uh, the SAPC and Centec, we are participating in the SADEC bouquet which is really uh, ensuring that we're able to share content within the region. So that, that's one of the exciting projects that um, we are involved with as a department. So for me, really, I do want to say uh, it's important that we need to coordinate because what we found is that there is a lot of fragmentation between all the relevant yeah. departments ourselves, arts and culture, but the good thing is that we are starting to work together, as I've indicated, through the Creative Industries Master Plan and other structures as well. So we are trying to make sure that we facilitate and coordinate so that we are able to make the necessary impact that is required in the country. 
So basically, in a nutshell, that is what we, that is what we do as a department. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah. So two key que uh, two key points coming um, from both you and Ayodele. One around access, um, and then the second one really looking at how we build cohesively or collaboratively, co collaboratively, um, as opposed to these like silos and you know broken mm -hmm. apart. Yeah. And 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 I think that's a big question around how do we meaningfully do that mm -hmm. between departments, between different regions, and of course different places. In the, eco, uh, in the ecosystem and value network. Nafi, I'd like to bring, <laughs> bring you into the conversation. Um, a little bit about who she is. She's currently, uh, Nafi Sise is currently the program manager who specializes in art, design, and handcraft craftship um, at DER slash FJ, which is an agency of the Senegalese government in charge of the promotion of entrepreneurship among women and the youth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. That is so delicious. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what that looks like. What are some of your challenges um, and tensions that you're grappling with currently? So, hi. Thank you. And first of all, thank you to Tegan and her team and the GIZ for inviting me and being able to, be, to talk about uh, my country and the creative industry in our country, Senegal. So my name is Nafi Sisse. I am program manager at DER. It's an um, agency under the authority of the presidency of Senegal, um, President Macky Sall. And um, we were launched in 2018 uh, in order to support the uh, women and youth. I'm sorry, I'm a bit stressed because it's my first panel in English. I want to say it. Uh, thank you. You're really, really doing amazing, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so our support is articulated in three pillars. So first, formalization. So we need to know in our country, nearly almost 90% of the economy is informal. People are scared to register their company because they say it's too complicated or maybe we'll, they will pay a lot of taxes. So we are helping them to, to do it and explaining to them that it's not that, that um, difficult and you won't pay that much taxes, but the country needs also that. So we are trying to change the mindset in that. Mm -hmm. So second, the training, so technical and financial, uh, technical and managerial, because as we were saying with uh, my colleague um, in Senegal, a lot of people are, for example, in art. They are um, in art, like they are great artists, very talented, but in management or entrepreneurs, they are they, there's weakness. Yeah. So we are trying to train them in that. And also in technical, because you now, like there in Senegal, you don't have that much of um, equipment, so it can be hard to train and everything, so we're trying to help them. And also financial support. So through nano or micro loans, um, equity or regular loans for our SMEs with the interest rate of 5%, and all this with a um, value chain approach. Uh, we are covering all sectors from agriculture to, to a creative industry with gaming, etc. Uh, so, so far, uh, so far in the creative industry, we've invested um, almost eight million dollars in the creative industry. So, since 2018, uh, we created our own incubator. And we co-created seven programs with our partners, which are ministries or, for example, in the private sector, Startup Bootcamp or also other universities, just uh, such as Draper University in the US, and MasterCard Foundation, also the, um, the French with um, the French uh, Agency of Development or the African Brain of Development. Um, we, I think we all know that the creative industry is the future, but there's still a lot of um, how to a lot of battles, yeah. yeah, a lot of battles. And for me, the government is supporting, mm -hmm. but the um, the, um, the battles has to to sorry to be owned by the the actors themselves. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and you did well. I think, I think we get it because these are the things we are all grappling with. You know, the issue of infrastructure, the issue of who's in the room and who needs to, 
who needs to be in the room um, with regards to the digital divide? Where are the women? Where are the young people? And what role are they playing right now? Especially when we're thinking about ownership, ownership of the platforms, but also ownership of the content itself, uh, so that we're not we're not the recipients. We are prosumers um, ourselves as well. So we'll we'll get into that a little bit uh, more. Let's hear from you, uh, 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 Mr. Glenn Gillis, who is the CEO um, and co-founder of Sea Monster. Um, he's also a member of the Pan-African, oh yeah, so Sea Monster, which is a member of the Pan-African Gaming Group. And prior to Sea Monster, Glenn served as the general manager at two of South Africa's leading film and animation uh, companies, that is Moonlighting Film Services and Clockwork Zoo, Africa's largest animation studio at the time. Where are you right now? <laughs> but I would like to hear a little bit about the tensions and challenges you are experiencing currently. Are you sure? I am definitely, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, and, and yeah, amazing to hear how many of the same issues we're busy dealing with. We know that games are massive. As somebody said just before lunch that bigger than the film and music industries together, and of course that's true. But they're also a massive instrument for change, and I love what you were saying um, about us not just being passive consumers, but actively involved in shaping our own narratives. Uh, let's really do it this time, because for a very long time, if you think about our value chain in the simplest sense, concept, production, and distribution. So made in Africa, whoops, hold on, I'm having a moment. Um, you know, th the concept is about our stories, our art, our music, and how do we get to s tell our stories in our own voice, the thing we've been trying to do for so long. Production is about made in Africa, and as Monica was talking about with Westgro and the kind of work that happens in the Western Cape, but of course all over the country, and in fact all over the continent, people are increasingly coming here to make um, their movies or their games, whatever it might be. Um, but really what's important is who owns that, because unless we participate in the sales and distribution leg, we're only ever going to be selling our time, selling our ideas, but never really benefiting from the flywheel of value, which is where IP and the creative economy works more generally. Um, so we feel pa passionately that something needs to be done at each of those three tiers, and each of them is different. One deals with copyright uh, issues, another is a very commercially driven one, and you know there's a, a fragmentation of the media. So how are we getting to participate once we cross the digital divide? Still, where is the money made? Um, particularly in gaming, most gaming is still funded by advertising. And so there are great companies who are starting to think about how do you bring the marketing guys into the space? Because uh, games are an incredible new way to communicate with your audience, to give them a sense of agency, to drive brand purpose, you know, with the decline of advertising, the money hasn't gone away and the need for companies to communicate with their audience hasn't changed. But they're not sitting in this room. They're not in this forum. Yeah. This forum um, presumes that the, this is purely entertainment. Um, and so one of the first things I think we need to do is realize that why we tell stories and why we tell games has always been the same. So to entertain... Uh, for social reasons, for commercial reasons, um, and of course for learning. And each of those silos needs is crossing over. This is, you know, Netflix is now driven with a subscription model, and then this weekend they kind of announced that they're going to have to put some advertising back into it. So, so all of these traditional sectors have operated largely separately. And I think while we come to grips with the exponential rate of change that underpins the 4IR, we also need to realize that it's disrupting these traditional value chains. So uh, one of the things that we try and do at Sea Monster is, and we've done this before because we've got nothing to do between 2 and 4 in the morning, is that we can't solve this problem on our own. And again, you know, to Leslie and all the guys who've made this possible, this is exactly why we need these forums. Um, there are two things. So PAG, Pan-Africa Gaming Group, is a collection of the 10 biggest studios in Africa. And that sounds very impressive, um, but actually Sea Monster, who employs about 60 people, full-time equivalents, um, and turns over less than $2 million a year, is one of the biggest. And we're a tiny business. 
you know, struggling to survive in our own way. But we've realized that there are 10 of us on the continent, and we share many of the same passions and desires. There's incredible people out there. So, you know, it's, you don't need to be alone in dealing with this. Um, one other thing to mention is Games for Change, um, which is out of New York, and, and they are passionate about games that drive social impact. Um, and they've trusted us to set up Games for Change Africa. So as part of Africa Games Week on the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of December, um, you know, we're asking people to come together around how games could be used in a social media, in a social impact context. And maybe just to close off to say, you know, we're also guilty of lazy thinking. And, and, it, and it, it, it goes like this. Um, small black creative businesses. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hang on a second. Small is one thing. You know, there are challenges to starting a business that are true for every businesses out there. Black-owned businesses and lack of access to capital is another issue. You know, the creative industries and the changing nature of you know, IP participation and the digital uh, divide issues is another issue. Um, and then, uh, and we, we sometimes put those words together and I think we're doing a disservice to them because each of them is something that merits proper analysis, proper research and proper action because it's got its own thing. And, and our government's guilty of it, most of us are guilty of it and I would just ask us to, to respect each of those for the challenges that they represent. Sure, what a powerful point, because if we don't name it, then we aren't able to really delve deep into what it is mm. and you know how else then we can think about um, resolving, moving, innovating around that. So, so, so thank you for that provocation, um, uh, Glenn. <laughs> We're going to unpack it, so please, you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> I'd now like to uh, welcome Ojoma Ochai, who's joining us online. She is um, um, the managing partner of the Creative Economy Practice and CC Hub, which has a mission to stimulate innovation and technology, uh, technology application to catalyze African creative economy growth. She sits on the board of the B Trust, an organization that was set up by Mr. Jay-Z himself and Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Block Inc. and co-founder and former CEO of Twitter. I don't know if she is online, and I don't know if we're able maybe to move our chairs a little bit um, to be able to see her. Just, just I am online. Hi. Hello. Hi. We're Hi, just everyone. making space Sorry. to see you properly. Okay. All right, you can go ahead. What are the challenges, tensions, kinks that you are currently facing? Thanks for that. Sorry that I'm not able to join you online, but hopefully I can still contribute. So I run a company called the Creative Economy Practice at CC Hub. And as you said, in reading the bio, we focus on um, supporting um, innovation and technology application in the creative economy. We focus on all creative sectors and we work through four main pillars. One is research, understanding the landscapes, the ecosystems, and at a granular level, the needs and opportunities in the different creative sectors. Um, our second pillar is ecosystem development, which is targeted at some of what has been said already about fragmentation, the need to collaborate. And so we host lots of meetups um, and we offer workspace, shared workspace in Lagos and Nairobi. And we do lots of events and activities that bring together Pan-African players in the creative economy. Our third pillar is um, investment readiness. So we, uh, we run incubators, accelerators. We're just finishing a Createch accelerator for 15 companies deploying some kind of technology, whether it's AI or, or a platform or blockchain to a particular creative sector. We've just also launched an um, accelerator program for fashion uh, supported by African Development Bank. So we have a whole line of programming around investment readiness. Our final pillar is around investment, and we do two things in this area. We support um, investors with the sort of knowledge and capacity that they need to invest in the creative in industries. I'm sure many people here have approached um, funders and investors, and they're always told, oh, but we don't understand the sector. 
And so we want to, to, so to end that once and for all by doing this program that helps them understand where is value created, what are some types of investment and funding tools that are effective, that kind of thing. We also do lots of investor advocacy to try and stimulate the flow of capital and the right instruments, um, because sometimes it's not that the capital is not there, it's that the way they're structured do not make them sort of conducive for the sector in terms of um, the requirements and so on. And then our fourth pillar, our last pillar of work still within investments is that through our syndicate funds that we manage, we invest in create tech companies. So we've, we, the, the tensions, there are a number of tensions that we have to, to navigate. And I, I sort of group them on that sort of four or five broad headings. One of the first things that we immediately saw was that there are the kind of systemic tensions as well as the individual tensions in many of the markets where we work, um, some of the tensions we, we face are not so much systemic, but in terms of sort of um, uh, cliques or cabals, I don't know if you guys have them in South Africa, but in many places where you work, you know, if you're in with this group, then you're automatically out with the other group of people. And so that's one tension that we face. As an intermediary, it doesn't really serve anybody to be in those cliques and, and cabals, as we call them. So that's certainly one tension that we're navigating every day. Another tension that we see is the tension between the old and the new, or maybe the established and the emerging, where we have all these gatekeepers that because they've had to, to, to suffer, in quotes, and they've had to go through stress to raise money or to become established, they feel like, it needs to be a rite of passage. And so we're encountering those kinds of established gatekeepers and players, not really giving space for the emerging to, to thrive. And it manifests in different ways in terms of the willingness to share, in terms of the willingness to give opportunity. And so that's certainly a tension that we're facing and often finding a mediating role to bridge between that sort of old and new and emerging and, and established. Another tension that we encounter is in terms of the way that governments behave. And there's a tension between them wanting to control and regulate and tax and a tension between supporting. So we're, again, always in our interaction with governments, we're always trying to, to just raise awareness about that tension, but try and think about how a balance um, can be found. Because obviously taxes are important and relevant to um, the growth of, of economies and, and the functioning of government, but we need to, we're often in this position where we're trying to get them to see how that need to tax and the need to control is in tension with actually a very important role, which is about them supporting and nurturing for it to even grow before they're stifled to death with licenses and taxing. A couple other things in this digital world that we suddenly see a tension between analog and digital. Um, there's some established business models um, that are being challenged by the new digital business models we're seeing. And so there's that sort of power of the incumbent in terms of some analog systems and how do you disrupt those models, um, whether it's in terms of distribution or in terms of even the way that services are, are delivered, whether it's training or, or whatever else. And then I think a final tension um, that I'd like to talk about is this idea of because you show up at the table, everything is your fault, right? And so I don't know um, if other intermediaries have faced this, but I go to so many places and I get asked, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about this? And what are you doing about that? Which is fair because those are the problems that people are encountering. But there's this thing about the one that shows up is the one that gets all the aggro. And it's kind of like, there's lots of people that should be at this table, often governments that are not at this table. And so at an intermediary, because you show up, you then get um, saddled with the responsibility of solving everything, IP, um, business models, everything. So I think there's also that tension between doing what you know you can do well at an intermediary versus the weight of the expectations because other people that should be intermediaries and at that table are not showing up. So those are some of the tensions. Um, in the next round of questioning, I can go back about some of the recommendations um, that I, uh, we, we've, or some of the things that we've tried out to manage those tensions. So I'll, I'll stop here for now. 
Thank you so much, um, Ujoma. <laughs> I, I could feel all of us laughing because we have felt that, right? Even on Saturday, we're like, Simu Luhong, there's so much more we want you to do. And they're like, no, 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 that's not our scope. Or at least we're doing what we're doing. I, I don't know if you have any, maybe, uh, yeah, anything you would like to respond to that Ujoma has said or any of the other panelists, something that you um, were thinking about or that is a tension that you'd like to expand on as well. Should we come closer? Okay, but we're not going to see Ojoma, or will oh, we just okay. hear her voice? We need to face them. Uh -huh. Okay, we'll just leave a window here. And another. Even closer. Now we are creating another tension because we won't see. Uh, we will. Okay, you'll. We've all seen her beautiful face. I think we'll try <laughs> just make space when she comes on stage. And she did, she outlined quite a, a number of interesting uh, tensions, similarly to what you've all have done. Um, and I don't know if you want to respond to any of those. Is this not, uh, I think you are, you are, on, okay. you are about to start. <laughs> right. I, think, I think for me, it's an issue that she raised to say, um, as government, to regulate or not to regulate. Yeah. I mean, when, when we look at other jurisdictions, they're actually moving away from tight regulation mm. into kind of a relaxed regulation. So those are some of the tensions that we face. Two, um, the issue that she, she raised, analog and digital. Yeah. And if you look at South Africa as a country, broadcasting sector has been heavily regulated. We now have new players. And there is a, a, an expectation that government, when are you regulating these other players? Mm. Because they are on our show, um, they are getting revenue from South African market. So those are some of the tensions that we are dealing with. The other thing that I wanted to ask you particularly is around the idea of policy, right? And policy instruments and frameworks. In my experience, or in my observation, it's like there's the discussion that's happening, the policy that's being developed, but the sector is moving so quickly that by the time this is ratified, <laughs> you know, we've already moved past that tension or um, focus area that we were grappling mm. with. Um, what are your thoughts around that? Maybe, maybe from, from you, Ayodela, you know, you're currently doing the work. Um, how, how are you engaging, not engaging with these uh, policies? Okay. Oh. For me, I think I'll, I'll speak from the animation side because I also run an animation studio. Um, I think policy is something that um, we are really grappling with as well. Um, I like what she said. I think the gaming industry is really getting more of leeway in Nigeria now than other industries like animation. Uh, for animation, it's still really, really, really underdeveloped in terms of policies, in terms of support. And um, one of the things that we are trying to do with my group, one of my um, colleagues, um, MB will be speaking tomorrow. He's, he runs Animation Nigeria, which is like the association for animators in Nigeria. He's asking ourselves, um, how do we really want to position ourselves as animators in Nigeria, either going as a service um, institution or going in terms of IP? So it, it's still something we are uh, grappling with, especially because we have the issue of copywriting and all that mm. still, you know, copyright is a really big issue in Nigeria right now. So um, it's something that we are trying to engage government, even though it's an election year right now and they are not, <laughs> they are not really interested much, they are focused on the politics. Um, we are hoping that we'll be able to sit at the <coughs> table and really present animation as an industry of its own and not like a subset of other types of, um, um, uh, other types of um, you know industries you know in in Nigeria. So um, it, it's a big challenge, you know, especially in terms of even um, one of the things also as a student we we are grappling with is actually the um, the e-commerce part of of the business. How do we really make money from this? Especially what is government doing in terms of um, image laundering? You know, in terms of how we are in, uh, we we get um, projects and get business from outside of of Nigeria. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an equivalent tax, but um, I guess we are still moving forward and trying to change that ecosystem. You are still showing up, as you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Glenn, you had wanted to uh, respond earlier, and I don't know if you want to maybe also expand on what um, Ayodele has also shared. Um, governments uh, perfectly prepare us to fight the last war, as opposed to imperfectly prepare us to fight the next one. And um, 
I feel very strongly that you know, you're coordinating efforts between a lot of departments. It must be exhausting. It's certainly exhausting for us um, as a small industry trying to sustain a business. Um, we're talking about survival here. This is not um, you know, a luxurious business where money just come to come. It's a hard work. Um, it's called the creative industries, and I think the focus there is really on the industries piece, you know, because if we need to get to scale. So the brutal truth is that I think that we, dis we succeed despite the best efforts of government. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's moving at such a fast pace. We, we're not large businesses, and I think governments everywhere <coughs> tend to think about the private sector and then themselves without realizing that, you know, in the creative industries, the, the analogy um, that we use often is of a wine glass. Um, we are from Cape Town, so <laughs> I'm paid to say are that. Are you bragging <laughs> like Monica? <laughs> but, you know, it's very thin and flat at the bottom. And these are the new entrants. And people are passionate about this. Uh, they want to participate. They want to be in the industries. And then the, th the stem is super thin. And then at the top, you've got a couple of very large companies. You know, in South Africa, it's NASPAS and, and pretty much only them and a couple of other maybe listed companies. Internationally, um, there are players because of this changing landscape that come into South Africa and further make that, that glass very wobbly. So, so you know, the, the handful of businesses that can get to some degree of scale, that can get to specialization then are trying to broker um, policy that actually suits the, us trying to get a more normal shape into our industries, where there are more small and medium-sized companies. And if you see what I'm saying, and so what happens is that only the big guys can really have the lobbyists, have the lawyers, can, uh, can actually afford the luxury of being able to engage with government to catch them up on where the, the next fight is going to be. Whereas the, the small guys are like, guys, we're just going to get on, self-organize amongst ourselves. We'll just do it despite you. Not to spite you, despite you. <laughs> just to be clear. And in spite of you, right? I, I think also Adela was speaking about the issue of competition. Uh, and um, I think Ojoma, you know, started to touch on that as well, this idea that Who's the intermediary between intermediaries? And also, what is the relationship between intermediaries in relation to where the money is coming from, where the support is coming from, and how can we build in such a way that even the creator does not see the intermediary as competition, but that we're building towards um, uh, the same kind of goal or vision? Uh, the other tension that I wanted you to maybe comment on as well, Glenn, is around the, the issue of social and economic value. I think that's another thing we're grappling, constantly having to negotiate or uh, you know, communicate the holistic value of the work that we're doing. But some people are just like, in nation building, where's that? Social cohesion, mm. how does this fit? Is this even real? Mm. Yeah, it's as real as our 22 million rand flag. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I'm not pulling any punches, guys. I mean, seriously, these are our stories yeah. to tell. And in Africa, we don't have the luxury of drawing a hard line between economic <laughs> and social issues. We are our people. Our people are the thing that we're going to compete with in the world. You know, once our resources are gone, the, the natural resources, we are the natural resource. And so, yes, we've got to build economic models which the world will look to yeah. uh, for inspiration. We can't think about extracting profits without the social context. We can't think about not addressing the environmental concerns because we're going to be most affected by them. Or we can choose to see that as an advantage. Um, you know, they've been talking about the triple bottom line for, for years, and what has it led to is even worse runaway capitalism. So I think our biggest opportunity is in a fundamentally new model that shows that these things can be reconciled. We can honor our stories, honor our cultures. That authenticity will, will uh, result in economic success, which will grow, you know, be put back into cult proper cultural um, uh, addressing the cultural imbalances in the world. All right.
right, thank you. And just to build on that, um, your Gita or your Jita, who is joining us from uh, the Zoom, is asking, what would the panel suggest to incent incentivize other players to show up to the table and the conversation? So maybe enough you can take that away. <laughs> you know, how can we incentivize and get more people to, to, to join in in this movement, so as, as it were? Oh, well, well, for me, for me, it can be a kind of difficult because I know on, only about Senegal. Sure. Yeah, only in Senegal. And we do have the same problem because for us, like the government, well, I'm working for the government, but still, <laughs> the, um, the, um, the priorities in our government is more agriculture or handcraft. And we want them also to have like creative industry into, in, um, in a priority. But for that, as I was saying, we need the actors maybe to create more table where we can have the government and also like the actors talking about the creative industry and explaining to them uh, what we can do and the business model saying that you, you can like, it's very important for the economy because people think that um, the most important is food in our country, but creative also economy can bring something to, to the country, economic way and also cultural. Yeah. We can flip Maslow's hierarchy of needs and start with self-actualization and build um, all, uh, all, all the way up. Let's bring you in, um, Ojoma, maybe if we can have a video up. Any um, thoughts around how we incentivize and get more people into this conversation? Sure, so I, I think <laughs> there, there are two things, right? Being an intermediary sometimes is a thankless job, right? So there's a bit of, you have to want to do it, incentive or not. Um, so there's, there's a bit of that that we just need to consider. On the other hand, though, I think there's a massive lack of understanding of how creative industries function. And I find this a lot with governments, with investors, with institutional supporters, that focus on the creative um, output part of the sector. So when they think about a film, they think about filmmakers, or when they're thinking about the fashion industry, they're thinking about fashion designers, without really considering that for these sectors to work and provide any economic or social value, all of these intermediaries, whether they're distributors or aggregators or supporting investment readiness, there's no way that all of these sectors can function without the role of the intermediaries. So I think in terms of that incentivizing, there's a bit of education that needs to happen so that people in positions of influence start thinking about the creative industries, not just from the, the, the perspective of creative activity. Obviously there's no creative industries without the creative activity, but the creative activity itself is only one part of what makes the industry work. So I think there's that education aspect so that national strategies, um, action plans, for creative industries start to recognize the role of the intermediary. I think that that will provide some sort of validation and incentive for people to see why those roles are important and what value those roles can create. But I think it also sees, helps people to see a pathway into the creative industry, because again, we find that when young people are thinking about the pathways into the creative industries, more often than not, they're thinking about creative professions, which is all well and good, right? There's, we have to have the writers, the filmmakers, the photographers, but that's not the only pathway into the sector. And so I think we also need to start to educate people wanting to get into the industry about all these other roles that make the, the ecosystem function that we need to have. Finally, we did a mapping many years ago. I used to work for the British Council. We did a mapping in Nigeria. And what the finding, one of the conclusions from the mapping was that the creative industries in Nigeria are inordinately represented by creative people. That's not a problem in itself, but what it means is if majority of the people in the industry are creative, you're only filling one part of the sector. And so everything else suffers. So I think we need to have that um, acknowledgement and education, awareness raising about all of the other parts of the ecosystem, including intermediaries so that people can, first of all, even be aware, and then with regulation and support from the various support institutions, funders, governments, and so on, more people can move into that space and do what needs doing. 
Sure, thank you so much. I think that, yeah, that point around education coming back again, communication, publicizing, evidencing the role and the value and the viability of the work that we are doing. Um, we have five minutes before we go into the open space discussion where you all kind of deep dive or get an opportunity in small groups uh, to really contribute to the discussion. I don't know if there's any question from the people here in Johannesburg um, that we can, yeah give to our panel. It doesn't even have to be a question. It can be a, a comment as well, or a contribution to some of the, yeah. Here. Do we have a mic here in the front? Again, please tell us who you are, okay. um, and then your question, right. thank you. Um, hi, I'm called Bobina, Bobina Zufa, and I'm from Uganda. Uh, it's not a question. You say we could just comment. When you're talking about the lazy thinking in the whole like small black African whole thing, I thought that was very interesting because I personally I work with a feminist collective and intersectionality is something we talk very much about, cross cutting issues and how they all need to be looked at critically, I'm a researcher and you know, unpack them and see how they all contribute to the issue as a whole. So I just thought that was very it was cool that you brought it up. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to just comment, thank you. And, and you know, one of the, uh, particularly uh, with that and, and what the previous speaker was saying as well, you know, we're fixated with supply side issues mm -hmm. and yet the economic model applies. Our challenge should be about accessing demand. Mm -hmm. So many of these things can be solved if you have long-term predictable demand. From the way that the organizations and the intermediaries organize themselves, we've got a struggle for funding on a week-to-week, month-year-to-year basis. Where do you think the effort then goes? You know, as you're scaling your business and trying to upskill and transform the business, we need to right-size it. And to do that, we need demand-side interventions and we can get the, econ the economists can tell us how to do that. The business people can tell us how to do that. So my one plea for this forum is to say, can we spend an equal amount of time talking about demand side interventions as we do as supply side? Incubators and hackathons only go so far, but you can't eat a hackathon. <laughs> Kanda is the person to talk to. <laughs> we know. She's been showing us the graph of, like, we need to be training kids right now. And I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> we wrote the strategy for her animation essay oh, together 15 sense. years that ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got, what, two minutes? I don't know if there are any... Yes, there we go. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks for the, um, the contributions. Um, one of the, the issues that has come up, and it was a, a research that UNESCO did, to show how much of the sector is actually informal and how difficult it is for uh, creatives to access. Uh, so the support is there. And uh, the comment that was made, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the lady um, that's online, but um, you know, it, it, it's literally, you know, you're being asked to give three-year business plans and so on. How um, can government and intermediaries maybe find a way of making it more enabling rather than, than sort of blocking. Um, yeah, that was really the question. Thanks. Thank you so much, Asis. Do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's spot on. Um, I mean, those are some of the things that whenever we engage in these structures, uh, they do come up quite a lot to say, how to make sure that they understand how to comply with tax, for an example, because you will not get any funding from government if you don't comply. Those are some of the critical issues that must be addressed for sustainability because that's another aspect that we have identified that creative businesses are not necessarily sustainable. So to how to make sure that we support them so that they comply with all these aspects that are required for them to be able to access all these support services. And how do we include them in the room as well to help us think through what those uh, responses could be, right? Like ways in which we can leverage even some of the TikToks of the world, the WhatsApps mm. of the world, to, to ensure that that voice is in the room when that framework regulation policy is being developed so that it really aligns to the people that it's meant to serve. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you wanna yeah, add I on to that. Add that um, I think that's one of the jobs that we have as intermediaries and uh, 
And I think that's one of the things that I'm um, trying to learn as well because I fall into that category of creative people who are now trying to look, like, get into uh, real business. So what, what, I, what, I, what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do now or we are trying to do is to try and get uh, the business people, the government people in the same room with the creative people because even the creatives probably do not, um, they, they really do not want to get into the business side of things. You know, so uh, one of the things that we are toying with is trying to see how we could have like maybe an agency or a commission or something that is able to take off, take on the uh, the business aspect of that uh, work, so that they can focus on the creative part, and then um, someone can take on that um, business and administrative side of, of of that for them, and then discuss with, with with government. The other thing I think we are trying to also do is to become like a lobbyist group as it were, you know, um, to really reach government. Even though it's very, very difficult for us, there's, there's not really that open door policy. Ojoma mentioned about the click thing. You know, and right now, everybody's working on eggshells because if you support anybody right now, you might be in trouble in six months' time. You know, so everybody's not supporting any government, we're not supporting any political candidates. We're just neutral because you, you can get into trouble. And because some of us are also waiting in the in the in the sidelines, waiting for an appointment, maybe a commissioner, maybe I've made a commissioner of Lagos, <laughs> you know, you know, so so that and I and I think more creative people should try and get into government too, and that's why I like uh, what she's doing as well. Because when you you're a creative person and you're in government, you kind of think like them, and you kind of know what policies you want to create for them. Unfortunately, we don't have that right now. And I think it's a slow process, but I think um, we'll crack it and we'll keep talking and keep talking until we get something done. <laughs> so you're basically saying we must burst our own bubbles a little bit, yeah. go into the unknown and maybe collaborate with the enemy strategically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to be able to, to, you know, to, to relate <laughs> and be able to build from, from an understanding, a holistic understanding. Yeah. Um, Nafi, I don't know if you have any closing remarks. I think we're almost reaching the end. So. Okay, great. From here, okay. Perfect. All right. <laughs> no, don't relax too much. Okay. <laughs> no, just I just want to say, yeah, exactly. It was the same problem in Senegal. People like the creative um, person, the creative industry, they have the same problem. They didn't want to go to to um, to the government because, as I was saying, they don't know what um, they think that is going to be very complicated and everything, but we are actually trying to help, help them to, to build a real business and um, trying to help them to, to be more formalized yeah. and to be able to have more funding. Like we provide funding, but we're also helping them to go to more funding uh, internationally. So we are actually trying to do it, it's not very easy. And even in terms of legislation, our agency tried to 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 help the bill uh, the bill the um, startup act to pass. It was in 2019, so it passed, and still now it's very hard to implement. Yeah. But as I said, we were trying, but it's very difficult because, as we were saying, creative industry is very fast-paced, and um, government sometimes do not understand what's in the creative industry, so it can be difficult. Sure. Yeah. Um, keep going, I guess. <laughs> uh, there yeah, are people trying. who are grappling with the same thing, so it, it, it's interesting how we can also connect around those and, and build some solutions. Here's a question um, from Ahmed al share or al Sheer. As Egyptian, as an Egyptian new media artist, how can we be in contact with your institution? So somebody who's sitting in Egypt, how can they then be part of this conversation and be in contact with, I don't know which organization they were speaking about actually. Um, yeah, if Ahmed can maybe add in, in the chat um, and maybe we'll move on to another question that he then asked. Um, to all the panelists, North African artists feel that there's a gap in communication with African institutions. How can we bridge that gap? So again, somebody who's asking, how do I become part of this? Um, I think, I think we, we can start by um, collaborating because I, I did a bit of that. I, I was fortunate to, um, to have collaborated with the Tunisian um, Tunisian studio, and, and I think it, it can start with um, what we did was in terms of uh, student exchange, in terms of um, Tunisian students uh, interning with us, you know, in Lagos, Nigeria, 
and we created a game project together. And I think that's kind of helped to start the conversation. And, and then, you know, we realized that we didn't really have much, um, there was not much difference between both cultures. We had the same challenges and the same uh, problems. And I think we could, we could start by that, you know, start in terms of how, seeing how uh, individual studios can actually do things together first, you know, and then we can scale it up in terms of uh, government. And I think that, you know, government also has a lot to do in terms of um, having um, working relationships and um, what they call it, agreements between these other countries so that it's easier for collaborations to happen co-production should happen, and you know, the conversion can, can, can go on from there. Unfortunately, the, the game we co-created together didn't really go far because we, we kind of paused at the funding stage and um, everybody went back to their various countries and... Um, <laughs> so sustainability, like how Sust we exactly. <laughs> All right, we have another question um, from Van Do you mind if I, Fanstein, you mind if I interrupt, sorry. Or ideas. What do you do if funding environment is too conservative or too old fashioned? Um, maybe we can bring you in, um, Ojoma. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. I was going to just speak on the thing about North Africa, but I can respond to the two sure. questions. So I think the thing with North Africa is really interesting. Two things for me. One is some people in North Africa do not, in fact, want to collaborate with Sub-Saharan Africa. And when they're talking about the continent, it's, it's really interesting. And I see that Ahmed has put in the chat as well, people in Egypt looking to um, exchange with Europe. But we've also encountered where people say things to us like, oh, we don't work in Africa, or, or we don't do partnerships with Africa, and they're sat in Egypt or something. So that's really fascinating um, to us. But I think one thing is people have to want to collaborate. But having said that, I think that one um, way for more of this collaboration to happen is for more Pan-African programming. And so as a practice, for example, unless there's a specific reason why we can't, all of our programming is, uh, programming is Pan-Africa because we believe that if people are not um, in the same cohort of incubation or acceleration, or if they're not doing a program together or co-creating, then how are they going to meet each other, know each other before they can partner and collaborate and trade? So I think more Pan-African programming, and I think there's certainly a role for multilaterals here. Multilaterals, whether it's the African Development Bank or, or Africa Export Import Bank, or just the AU Africa-wide organizations, I think they have a role in ensuring that when they're designing support and interventions, they're finding ways to embed that whole Pan-African working into the models that they're, that they're, into the sort of programs that they're designing because the, the key thing, obviously, is for people to first know each other before they can collaborate. To the question about um, funding for new things, I already put in the chat, in, in, when you look at models of successful uh, creative industries, you find that there's deliberate investment into R&D, research and development, and deliberate investment into innovation, because that's where you find the markets and the products of tomorrow. And I feel like as intermediaries, as governments, when we're thinking about our strategies, we need to not only be thinking about the business models of today, but what's the support for emerging business models or emerging products or emerging markets? And how can we support them now so that we can have a pipeline of the sort of models for tomorrow? So I think R&D and innovation are often missing from these strategies and they have to be highly visible. We have to be proactive about funding those things that we don't yet know whether they'll stick or not. But yeah, it's important. It really is. And I can see Ahmed agreeing with you there and saying thank you for answering that question. We have another one from Yogita. Yogita, would it be valuable to adopt or adapt a CBD type system that caters to different sector players showing up? Per the program pack, I saw that there are already a few bodies across a few African countries uh, who with an African relevant continuous, ooh, oh, sorry, question. Would an African relevant continuous participation point system help for creative digital industries? Yo, Yojita. Thinking out loud too, not as a gatekeeper, but as a recognition and encouragement. Should I read that again? Yeah, yeah I didn't, it caught me off guard also. I did not realize. <laughs> Uh, 
page. So we've page. asked that already. Oh, you have already. Yes, okay, sorry. yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we've already asked the incentivization one. I think this one is more about um, a continuous participation point system to help uh, the creative digital industries. I've got a view, and that I think goes to control versus flexibility, the point that we were making. It sounds to me like we're going to try and over-regulate an industry. Mm -hmm. You know, the creative uh, industries and the roles um, defy description. And, and if we particularly want to talk about innovation and by speed, you know, we're not dentists. Um, and so, you know, we're now going to go potentially down a rabbit hole where we start to try and just put things into small boxes, small boxes and then try and, then and try you know, have some structure around that. I, I think that's one way. Another way is to be, have a massive bias for action. And, and let me say, because I haven't been contentious enough yet, so I'll try harder. Um, you know, I, I'm going to say that I think that GIZ and the French governments do more for the creative industries on this continent than our local uh, national governments do. And why? Because they have a bias for action. They literally get stuff done. We're all here today for a good reason. And I would just say, like, where we're trying to find old models to fix new problems, Caution, caution, caution. Let's rather do things, dirty learning, and then figure it out. Just a quick comment on the um, how you incentivize participation in the economy. You know, one of the most efficient things you can do is a tax credit. It works so well in Canada and in many states, and I've been part of the research around this, and I'm sure the academics in the room could add a lot more nuance to it. But if I, I, Germany did this again uh, during COVID, so if you were an artist and you had been contributing tax revenue, which people tend to do when their societies, you know, give back, you got back a stipend that allowed you as an artist to survive during COVID. So there was an incentive to pay tax in the first place. There was a quick and efficient distribution mechanism um, to get money back to the people who were literally on their own, who were, you know, most creatives are freelancers. Most creatives work for themselves. So they're very simple things that we can do. And what we shouldn't do is make it complicated because we don't have the wherewithal to implement the simple solution. Sure, that's quite interesting. And I think also building for agility, right? Like not building for five years, six years. Life is, the sector is moving quite rapidly, and to, I don't even know what to say to that, but I agree with the idea of also incentivizing production, creation, and consumption, rather than just one, one, one part of the value chain. I don't know if you have any comments. Ojoma, if you have any comments. Oh, there's a comment and a question in the room as well. Um, thank you, just a comment and maybe um, a small contribution. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Bethlehem. Uh, my intermediary background is somewhere in games, not for the entertainment business, but mostly around the um, agenda of games for change, but also thinking about games uh, for the future, basically. And so because this is a way of really communicating uh, on so many different uh, parts of the creative sector. And so one of the things that really struck me in this conversation is, of course, we're all creatives here and trying to push for uh, the best possible um, um, products out there that we can also push and be a global standpoint, basically. Mm -hmm. But then we're really lacking that um, demand, side, demand side and uh, intervention, and that's really one of the... Um, positions that what I'm looking for um, in this forum here and um, because of this also in my industry in Ethiopia um, for the past six seven years we've been working around okay how do we understand the market not just in Ethiopia but also in Africa and so one of the things that we've created with such um, cultural institutes like the Goethe Institute is connecting and creating this pan-African um, combinations of game uh, thinkers out there so we've been doing projects for 15 countries to come together in Africa, but also develop ideas for different things, not just entertainment, but really developing out there um, things that they have in mind. And so what really comes to my mind out there is that um, after the whole project was done, right, there were these initiatives that came um, on board uh, with the idea that there was a study that 
games ideas and entertainment ideas are actually saturating in the global west and so content is being has been overused and are now really looking forward to content and different ideas in Africa and so there was this intention to produce something together with Africans mm -hmm. And so that has also a positive side that it links cultural exchange and in that creates a very different alternative uh, kind of use of the potential of games. But also that should be able to kind of help us see that this demand also exists here because we have content that is still being untapped, right? And so that is a fact, but where to start again for the creatives is another big question that um, I hope that we can find bits and pieces of answers to. And you know what I like about the next session? Is that we can have even more conversations about the questions that have emerged from this discussion. We will be dividing the group into eight groups, correct? Four here in person and four online. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to really dig deep now in some of the things that are emerging that are coming out. And now we're noticing just from having this discussion. So. Um, here um, in uh, Johannesburg, we will divide. So yeah, so there'll be two groups under roles and assumptions for digital animation, one online and then one here in this plenary room. So if you're interested in um, digging deeper around digital animation, you'll stay here. And then roles and assumptions for digital games will be in that small room over there. Um, and then roles and assumptions for immersive media will be Okay. Okay, cool. So we're merging immersive media and digital creative industries. So animation here, gaming, and then the uh, bigger group uh, behind. And then if you're joining us online, you will have an icon pop up and you're able then to select whichever room you'd like to be um, a part of. What's exciting is that our panelists will be part of that um, discussion really. Not now we get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> it's been fun. Um, and yeah, the question that we're asking or the discussion will be uh, divided in this way. We'll look at who is in the room. Um, secondly, how do you interact? Have you worked together? Can you, could you? Uh, number three is who is missing from this room? And most importantly, who's missing from the value chain? Thank you so much for that really interesting conversation. Thank you, Ojom, as well. Thank you to all our pen. I saw 99 comments. That's a first for me, at least. <laughs> so we really. We've really tried to make it as hybrid as possible. And what's really exciting as well is that later, we're going to be doing a speed networking situation, um, which will allow all of us to meet, actually, both online, offline. It will be a hybrid um, networking um, opportunity. So please do not leave at the end of those open uh, forum spaces. Those will end, I think, at 4. And then we'll do our networking from there onwards. Thank you so much. It's been such a great morning, a great start. Um, have fun. Um, and I'll see you, I think, tomorrow morning. Hashtag Fagu 2022. Enjoy the open forum sessions. Thank you so much. to please fill in the registration form. If you have not filled in the registration form, just to give us consent to use your images online. We are also swapping, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're swapping the rooms. Hello, just two seconds. So gaming will still remain in the room Ladies, just two seconds. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So the gaming group will go in the small room and we're swapping um, animation and digital industries. So we'll have um, animation in the room down at the bottom and all the people who are joining the creative industries group will stay in the theater. Thank you.
One, two. Thank you. Yes. All right. Hi. Um, yeah. I'm called Bobina, Bobina Zofa, and I'm from Uganda. I'm a researcher, and I uh, work with a feminist collective uh, of academicians, data scientists, etc. And personally, a lot of what I do is research around emerging technologies. And I've also just uh, done some work around um, the digital creative industries in Uganda. And yeah, that's pretty much my background. Thank you very much. Hi, um, Catherine from Kenya, uh, working with Safaricom PLC, which is a telco in Kenya, the biggest telco in Kenya. Our role or our inch is, um, is we do enable the industry, uh, especially the creative industry, so by giving them, you know, platforms so that they can monetize their content. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, so Nafi Sisse uh, from Senegal. Um, I'm working for a um, state agency for the government. And what we're doing really is to invest uh, in, the, um, in sectors, in different sectors, uh, such as the creative industry. Hi, my name is uh, Marion Louis Grancilla. I'm uh, running an art space in uh, Dakar, Senegal, called Kurtiosan, uh, working with artists and new media and with art and public space. We have a festival called Afropixel. So I feel in, I, we are non-profit, so I don't feel really in industry, but we are really intermediaries between uh, all the sector. Hello, I'm Victoria from GIZ. Um, I do oversee the work that we do with our partners like Fakugezi, Animation SA, Durban Film Art, DCDT hopefully <laughs> here in country, but I also um, try to understand how that can feed into our other partner countries, Senegal and Kenya, which is why I'm very excited that you are also here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Monica Rohrbeck. I head up the film and media unit in an agency funded by government. There's about a hundred of us, but there's three in my unit, so it's uh, it's a lot of heavy lifting, and I'm really excited to see how we can all work together because together we can do that heavy lifting. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, hello, my name is Chapchumba. I'm from Kenya. I am the founder of African Digital Art. Um, I've worked over 15 years in bringing digital art from the continent to the forefront, and I've worked with so many partners. I'm always in between spaces never belonging anywhere, always feeling homeless and confused. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I hope you're not feeling hopeless today or <laughs> homeless. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Nompumile Lobutelezi. I'm from the UKZN Digital Art School. Um, my main purpose for being here is that I'd like to see um, or we'd like to figure out how best to prepare our students to um, actually be ready for work in the digital creative industry and, and not feel like they're lost and drowning. So, yeah, just here to learn and observe. Thank you very much. I think what I appreciate about this group is that we're quite diverse. We're coming from different countries, and I think we can be able to learn quite a lot uh, amongst ourselves. So the second question that we need to answer is, how do we interact? Have you worked together? Can you? And I think for me, probably the most important question is, can you? Because it might be that you have not worked together, but can you then work together? And how can we interact? Anyone can start, colleagues. Well, I can start because we are two from Senegal. <laughs> I'm from, uh, as I say, informal, uh, sector and she's from the government, but we, we know each other. We, I know some people from our organization, but uh, I can say that it's not so easy. There are some big gaps to, to work together because they have their realities. As she explained, to work to, with the government, I explained her that since we started, we opened the first Fab Lab in Dakar. We received many government people uh, from different ministry of uh, craft, uh, artisanal, from uh, 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 f from the mayor, from the city, and sometimes, honestly, we have the feeling that we support <laughs> the institution, as uh, as he explained. We we do. Sometimes we can do quicker 
in informal way, but we have a big impact. But after, for us, we, we get tired also. And uh, they also have their reality with their programs. So as some people say, we work more with GZ, uh, uh, foreign institution, foreign network. It's easier to work. And I think that we have lots to do together. So that's my first contribution. And I think for me, there was a question that was raised um, when we had a panel here that said, how can we work together? Probably as a region, as a continent. For me, that's quite critical to make sure that we are able to share experiences as, as different countries. Anyone? I, I think the person that I know here from Kenya, have we interacted before, is Mike. Uh, the rest of us, no, but are there opportunities? Yes, indeed. Um, sitting from a telco perspective, um, I see an opportunity because when it's all said and done, and especially in the creative industry, when you do what you're good at, you know, you're behind the scenes doing what you, you know best, at the end of the day, you need distribution. And that's what telcos give you. They give you the distribution so that you can do what you're good at. Uh, so I see an opportunity to interact uh, and to work with almost everybody in this room, uh, because we do that. Uh, either you have your own platforms, either you're running your own production houses, we work with everybody. So I see that big opportunity, um, and I think, you know, by the time we are done with this, I, you know, it's to be more about how do we get to, to, to take this conversation to the next, you know, to the next, uh, yes. Um, Mike Strano, I run a st entertainment startup called Yakwetu. Yakwetu in Kiswahili means of us and for us. So Yakwetu retails digital content from Africa, for Africa. We, our first service is My Movies Africa, mymovies.africa. You can rent or own movies from across the continent. We will also be going into TV content, animation, VR, um, audio books, podcasts, and games. Um, just a one-stop shop for online retail of content. So that's our that's our vision. Um, are we into these questions yet? Yes. Question two. How do we interact? Um, how do we work together? Um, yeah, very similar to what Catherine has said. As uh, so, our company is involved in distribution and retail. Um, so we're willing to work with anyone who has great content. Um, and uh, we're really focused on film at the moment, film documentaries, shorts, animations. Um, but as we expand, so as we, since we have our, our larger ambition, we're still collecting content, um, contacts and developing our network for our future growth as well. So that's why attending these forums is very important, attending content markets, um, also joining, you know, the world has gone online, so also joining forums online if you can't make it in person as well. The world, in the last two years, the world became very small, yeah. Just, uh, yeah, just quickly, uh, for interaction, as she was saying, first of all, for us, for, for example, nationally, we need to, to interact with each other, so to understand each other, so government and other actors and other, even, I think even between actors, as um, distributors and maybe uh, people in the crea creation, they, we all need to understand each other and all we, to, we all need to interact. And after internationally, for us, like Senegal is a very small country, there's a lot of things to do. And as we were saying, creative industry is moving very fast. And I think we are a bit behind. And it's nice also to be, to be able to travel and to go and see what's happening in other countries so you can go back and do the same in your country. So I think that's the way we can interact. Um, Yes, in, in Dakar, the, the creative industry, as she says, is going very fast and we have a lot of gaps. I can say that for long times we, we train, we do many workshops inviting foreign uh, teachers to or artists to come and train younger, uh, young artists in Senegal. So it's very good also to exchange and there is a, 
uh, a challenge between anglophone and francophone uh, countries. For example, with uh, Chimologong, through um, uh, Tegan and uh, Digital Imaginaries, we had a, a, a program called Digital Imaginaries. We invited Chimologong during the COVID. We made uh, IA trainings, online trainings in, for artists and entrepreneurs in Dakar. It was very good experience. So we also received during Afropixel some uh, VR, XR uh, creative uh, entrepreneurs to come and train uh, artists. But it's just for 10 days, and after we cannot continue, that's the problem. <laughs> that's very interesting. Um, I'll tell you why. The report that I made a reference to um, when we, we had a panel here, the 4IR report, it actually talks to the new skills that are required by the creative industries within the 4IR, your artificial intelligence, augmented reality, all those skills to make sure that we are also on par uh, in making sure that we are able to distribute our content also in different platforms and different formats. I'm not sure whether do we have any participants online? Oh, we don't. Oh, no, that's fine then. They have their own moderator online. Hey, so I guess all of our inputs will be collated. So uh, I got very excited because Mike actually introduced himself, says, oh, no, we know each other from African Film Consortium, a WhatsApp group from before COVID. And it was very helpful. And you're very active there, I must admit. But it was great to meet you in person. And I look forward to your panel. Um, we. Also, as Westgro have a membership in the African Film Commission's WhatsApp on, you know, and we actually have membership at the AU in that, so we can ask each other questions. We are um, obviously taking part in as many of these forums as possible, so that's where we interact. We educate each other online, so on, in my in promotion mandate, we have a WhatsApp, uh, uh, sorry, a LinkedIn group or we just post stuff that's interesting because mailing with protection of personal information has become very difficult. So we don't do as many mailers and people don't seem to read them anymore. Anyway, maybe they're not that interesting, but um, you can read, uh, you can get analytics on who's interacting with your data. And it just seems to be easier to do that online and throw it out there and hope people pick it up. So we're active, we connect on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on TikTok, we we really try to connect and and we are stronger together and and I really think that as the African Continental Free Trade Act moves forwards and recognizes this industry and we get some freedom of artistic movement, I hope that will solve a lot of blockages to creation on the continent. And yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the AI tools, but there is. In fact, your colleague on that panel, Choma, she did quite a big research on those tools, and we should all read that paper. She had a, a, a big presentation the other day, and she mentioned that paper. So I, I think connecting to her, she's also in charge of a big, well, one of the seven people on the board for that uh, bit, Jay-Z, and um, the, other, the founder of Twitter, Twitter Jack Dorsey, funded uh, project on on Bitcoin funded projects and she's doing a lot of conferences I think the last one was in Kenya um, talking about the, uh, the options of Bitcoin and the wave 3. Point, what is it w w w 3.0 yeah because it's all about blockchain yeah you know it you wrote the paper on it for our country thank you um, any other input? Oh, I wanted to say, and at SAV, South African Audiovisual Forum, we get to meet quarterly with everybody behind the scenes so we can share our, our issues. Um, yeah, I think the forum that she's talking about is inclusive of government. Um, sometimes we do um, invite the industry, especially if they have issues that they would want to bring to the attention of government. Uh, I mean, it's various uh, government departments and government agencies, even the funders and government as well, they sit in that forum. So it's quite a useful forum. And as she's saying, because of COVID, there was a bit of a lull, so we do need to, to revive it. Any other input? Okay, um, I, don't, I haven't directly worked with anyone here, but uh, as a researcher, I think for me, the 
can you work together? I see that very much in um, from my interactions with at least the people I've talked with so far. I feel like um, I've there's just been a lot to think about in terms of the critical questions for us to be asking when talking about this industry, but also uh, something that we uh, talk about a lot, which is uh, the dissemination of our work beyond just the people who typically read these papers and getting it out to you know the people who ideally should also be reading these papers and so how to creatively do that and I feel like that comes from like interactions with this and I like that I'm hearing about like uh, people who are working around AI because I've been working on like a framework to uh, dealing with like ethics and um, just all that rights and what uh, pertaining to AI on the continent and so I feel like that is still pertinent with uh, the digital creative industries um, conversation you know, talking about like um, all these issues of datafication, digital racism, etc. I feel like it ties in very much. And so, yeah, I think it's just a lot of things for us to talk about in yeah, Instagram. I think you're very, you are very, very interested because I've learned now when you have such big brains on the issue of ethics, you can help me in the story line and you are being used in film making nowadays. So, uh, yeah, so for me, that's another issue that's quite critical that we need to be bringing to the conversation why we introduce technology, that they are unimplemented technology. Um, thank you. So like I said, I'm from UKZN. Um, as an institution, we are definitely trying to learn from what Fitz has done here, which is um, like a really great program. And we saw from the festival last week that they're doing really amazing work. Um, can we work together? Definitely. Um, our little digital art school is still growing. So uh, what we want to make sure that we're able to do is that we make uh, relevant connections for our students so that by the time they are done with their studies, like I said, they're able to actually go into the industry and work. Um, I heard someone mention uh, ASA and um, also the Center for, sorry, I'm forgetting it now. Um, Center for Creative Arts, which we work with in uh, KZN, but also we want to make sure that we're not just working provincially, but making sure that we are connecting in South Africa and in Africa as a continent. Uh, currently, we're working with uh, performance artists from Belgium who have come to our university to... <laughs> who've come to our university to uh, work with some of our honor students. Okay, um, so like I was saying, uh, currently we have a group from Belgium who's working with our honor students and he, um, while the group is doing uh, AR work with them and uh, in particular they work with performance arts linked to AR. Uh, but again, there's lots of work to do. There's lots of funding to consider. And again, uh, we as a school need to make sure that we are part of all of these forums to make sure that what we teach is relevant by the time the students graduate. So, yeah. Who is missing from the room? <laughs> oh, from the entire room. I always like to go first, then I, I can settle down. I get so excited. So, so many people are missing from the room, unfortunately, and we're the lucky ones. So it's up to us to take the responsibility to virtually bring other people into this conversation when we can. And I'm looking forward to how to connect the, some of the missing people. So who would be missing would be, well, we have an example of a broadcaster telco here. So that's really exciting. I would like more of them to be in the room. I see Telcom is in the room virtually because they're sponsoring this. So I hope they hear about this and they decide to keep funding these kinds of conversations. But technically, corporate social investment, so much needs to be in here to help drive the future of African 
digital creative economies. The Ikoko people should be here. And Ikoko is the French, sorry, I know German sponsored this a lot, but the French are here too. And, I, and they're doing something online and there's some research going on again with the same doctor. So I think the Ikoko people need to hear a bit more about this and map into these kinds of conversations. I'm sure they will, but it's like an online marketplace and I just really think it's cool. Um, I hope it's successful. There's many of those kinds of projects on the continent, so let's try to connect them to this research and this mapping. And I don't think it'll ever be complete, but thank you for representing government, industry, uh, tertiary institutions, and the Center for Creative Arts, very close to my heart. I used to work there, and you know, UNESCO mentioned the Durban Film Mart as being the best mart in Africa, so it's an African project and most of your projects at that center are African in nature. And um, yeah, um, we're not that far apart uh, virtually anymore, so it's easier to link up. And I'm interested in hearing what the other room is doing. But I think our national bodies, there's three, Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, Department of Trade, Industry and, Co and Competition, and your department, Department of Communication. So you have to represent all three now, but our national bodies do a great deal of work in this industry, so I thank you for representing. Thank you very much. Colleagues, when we were having this, the session here, uh, I think there was an issue that I think was quite critical that was the, the demand side of the session. So let's also think about that. If there's new regulation here, because for me, once again, the creatives are quite well represented. Mm -hmm. The demand side of things, that's what I think you might need to think about. Um, we speak about creative industries, so I think we miss more uh, artists and uh, artists and uh, creative people, uh, and also education uh, and schools because it's very wide. Uh, we see in uh, Senegal that there are many private schools doing much more sometimes than uh, the fine art school also. Uh, to train the young generation that is uh, now you have many online uh, no you can online train yourself find solutions so you see in many fields like robotic and uh, makers and young people try to 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 train themselves in IA and look for opportunities so the education sector yeah. is missing i think Maybe I'm wrong, but I think also who's missing is the private investors. I think we, because I don't want to do that, but I don't want to say that, but at the end of the day, it's all about money. <laughs> we need money. We, we need to, um, to elevate our economy, so we need the private investors also to be on board. Um, I think something that we're missing is also... Um, uh, what enables the digital creative industries is digital technologies, and they are creator, creators of these technologies, the designers of these technologies. And so when we're talking about issues of, like, say, bias, you know, for example, let's say content creation, content moderation, and issues like that, the designers need to be in the room to hear the problems, That because if we're saying there is digital racism, then we cannot address that if the creators are, in, are not in the room, because we're just on the receiving end of the take, so w they, I feel like they need to be in the room as well. Technology is not an end to itself. It helps to serve a certain purpose. So if they're not part of the conversation, then it means when they design, they'll be missing the plot, if I may call it like that. Any other input? Okay, let's go to the chairs and then we'll come to you. Uh, I would say also it's always surprising to me that a lot of the software companies wouldn't take an interest, like the Adobe's and the whomever's, um, just because it's intrinsically linked and there's, it seems like more and more as like software is becoming user friendly, there's still, m I hardly ever meet like the people who are making the software that inevitably digital creatives will use in these conversations. So it's really interesting to see which bubble they're in because we 
really never get to interact with them. Yeah. I think we've heard both. Okay, let's do Christian and then we'll come to you. I, I know we have government presence, um, but I think also I think from a Pan-African perspective, governments need to get more involved. Um, this is the next industrial revolution for Africa. They don't seem to get it. Uh, even in South Africa, with all its level of development outside of, you know, uh, compared to the rest of Africa, it's not really given, there's, there's a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, let me just put it that way. Um, in a lot of countries, as is normal with most sectors, the industry is leading and government is following. Um, but the challenge is around policies, around uh, intellectual property right protection, anti-piracy. Uh, piracy takes 99% of our revenue out of the ecosystem. You know, So we will become noticed as an industry once we start generating that revenue, once we unlock it from the informal sector, from the illegal sector. But it needs enabling laws, of which there's only one in Africa at the moment, and that's in Kenya, um, and that enables um, uh, our friends in ISPs to actually block a customer's access to pirated content. Kenya has the first law for that. I'm not sure South Africa is going to look at that law. Um, Nigeria is adopting the Kenyan law. Um, so it's, it's very important. We're actually now currently working with Safaricom uh, as one of the ISPs in the country to begin blocking sites as well, uh, consumer access to pirated content. So hopefully over time that will unlock, in, in Kenya that's about a billion dollars a year uh, that the creative industry loses um, to piracy. Um, so that, imagine that being injected into your creative economy overnight, policy makers, software companies, everyone will begin to take notice of you. So I think we need the regulators to work as a team with industry to fast track the right regulations. I think the Nigerian law is being, revi is being revised for the first time in 20 years, I think the copyright law, and I think even the South African copyright law, the last time it was revised was 20 years ago. So if, unfortunately our industry takes a long time to get around to. Yet, if it's a trade policy for agriculture, for example, you probably find that it gets revised and pushed out in a year. So we need to be able to get policymakers to speed up their service to the creative industry. Yeah. No, I think it's spot on. Um, for us in South Africa, we are busy with the white paper on our forehead. But of course, the one of the recommendations that we are making in that white paper is that the ISP we have to make sure that the regulators are working closely with the ISPs so that they block their sites because the issue of piracy is killing the creative industry. I see, and I mean, I mean, as you say, the loss is quite huge. Yeah. So it's something that is quite important. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, I think we need everyone, to be honest, from the lawmakers to the consumers as well. We need also the consumers. For example, um, in Senegal we have series, TV series, but they are all um, in French or in uh, our one of our language, one tribe, Wolof. And consumers were complaining about it because some people cannot understand and they want to understand and they cannot. So because we were complaining, so that they decided to, to change it, so just add uh, um, uh, how do you, how do you yeah, subtitles, to have subtitles, and so that we can, so, so people in other countries, so for example, Cote d'Ivoire or, or stuff like that, they can watch our films and it's better. So because of the consumer, because we compla they complain about it, so they change it. Just want to say that. I think the one solution that does have those regulations to make sure that the um, So um, I spoke about Custos earlier, and Mike's already been in touch with me, achieving a, a startup at a university in Stellenbosch got the patent for their embedding of Bitcoin, a, a bit blockchain 
markers into PDFs so the contracts would be validated and couldn't be copied. But they've been also using it in film and they embed uh, the sort of bits or whatever it is, the blockchain, into different frames. And so if I was a journalist and you sent me your film and somehow mine got leaked, everybody would know it was mine. But as soon as it got up online, they would be able to tell the ISP there's an illegal pirated uh, thing and, and the costs might come back to me because they know it came from me and I caused the leak. So there's the miners find that Bitcoin on the, on the blockchain out there once it's out on a torrent or wherever these things go to be pirated. So we have to find the illegal content and not not worry too much about it if everything can be watermarked as owned by someone. And then if the owner gets transferred, then you know it's easy to, to update the blockchain from what I understand, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I think we can step towards full blockchain, which is really, really protected, and just use the watermarking now as a, as a temporary measure. You do have to go out there and police it. But uh, yeah, the consumers need to be s in this room in that they need to stop stealing content. And research, from what I understand, has shown that people want to pay, but often they can't. Because I know when Netflix wasn't here, a lot of people bought VPNs to watch it technically illegally because they pretended to be in North America or whatever. So everybody has to put up their hand if they do that kind of thing and stop it. But at least they paid for it. I'm going to say that much. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. I think you're quite right. Um, the issue of um, uh, digital literacy is one of the things that we are, we are recommending in our white group. No, it's just to agree on the point. When, when we say who's missing in the room, well, we would want the consumers to be here, mm -hmm. but I think the voice of the consumer in any, uh, in, you know, any forum should always, we should always start with the voice of the customer. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is, we are here, we are discussing digital creative industry, how to scale it up. But we need to have the voice of the customer. Ask yourself, why do customers pirate? What are the issues that they are facing? I just attended a conference just the other day, and um, you know the question was, why is it that the digital creative industry is not taking off like it's supposed to take off? Um, I mean, we all have the devices, uh, because that is indeed the direction we are all going to, but we don't seem to take off for Africa, one way or another. It's either the piracies, it's either the costs, there are very many things. So it's about also bringing the room, uh, bringing the voice of the customer in the room. Then from there, we work it out. Because if we don't put that voice, we might as well sit here all day. Uh, and we might all you know, be saying government should be here. But the customer is actually telling us what it is that they want. Mm -hmm. So I think in our future interaction, let's start with research here. You know, they'll tell us what it is the customer actually does want. Yeah. Market, because once we understand the mic, I mean the psych of the end user, we can then be able to address probably some of the issues that we are raising here, and the content that everybody is creating, it has to go somewhere at the end of the day. Someone has to consume it, and if we don't understand that consumer, then it becomes a challenge. Any other input? I just want to say how remarkable the films and the curation of the of the art was here, and you know, to have seen that that one dance piece, that was extraordinary. And they merged AR, ar augmented reality, and um, lidar photography, and a story that was so evocative, and music that was so evocative. If every child in the world could watch that one piece, and that's just one, many of them moved me, the world would be a better place. I'm, I'm, I promise you, I was at Eastern Cape Film Festival, standing outside our lodgings, looking at the star, and there were brilliant stars, our TV stars, our movie stars, who'd never seen the southern um, sort of 
galaxies. You know, they look like clouds. So we have the Milky Way, but here in the Southern Hemisphere, those clouds. And they look like clouds, but they're clouds of galaxies, billions of stars. And because they mostly worked up here from young, they never got out of the light pollution. And they were going back home in a beautiful, pristine place. And they saw that. So part of that, that show that I watched had those stars at the center of it that were all stardust. And in fact, what we're doing now influences eternity. So we really need to recognize that we're all stardust and make good decisions now. And so I really encourage you, if you have a chance to watch that or if you have a chance to platform it, if you have a chance to platform those, uh, those new shows from uh, Electric South, etc., please do so. They are, they are going to help our children become better planetary citizens. Thank you. Vic, do you want to add something? very much. I mean, for me, the question is always also looking at maybe government again. And we heard a lot about, um, you know, we, we always say government needs to be in the room uh, and we and government doesn't understand. So my question is, what do you need in order to understand, in order to take maybe different action or, or respond faster and, and, and foster the system? So that's looking back at you into the system, who do you want to be there? Who do you need to be there in order to yeah, engage? <laughs> I think for me, in South Africa, it's something that has been overdone, really. Um, government trying to engage uh, with the industry. But I think for me, sometimes we don't understand uh, our positions in terms of where the industry is or where they want to go or what their interests are. Because as government, we've got bureaucracy. We've got compliance issues. Yet the industry is telling us something different to say, you need to be agile. Government is not agile at all. We take time to reach certain decisions and do certain things. And the industry is moving. As people are reflecting today to say, the industry is moving at a very fast pace. So as government, how do we make sure that we adapt and make sure that we are agile as well so that we are able to meet the requirements and the needs of the industry? And probably sometimes, as I said in my presentation here, uh, issues around regulation, we need to be flexible when it comes to regulations and adapt as the industry continues because sometimes our regulations are quite frustrating for the industry because they constrain them in terms of what they want to do. So we need to have that flexibility. If I can make an example, um, we had an, an, engage, an engagement some time ago where the public broadcaster was actually raising some of these frustrations to say, we need to comply to certain financial um, compliance for them to, to, um, to uh, what's the right word, to procure content. Uh, and in that instance, we were able to understand that the SAPC has to compete with other players in terms of making sure that they have compelling content. If we constrain them with some of these regulations, we are actually disadvantaging them. So I, I, I do concede to your point that as government, I think we need to be agile and need to respond to the current environment and the current situation. So I think we have exhausted the, th the three questions that we're supposed to deal with. Uh, but I think the point that we have not emphasized on is the value chain, which I think is quite important. And in some of the engagements that we'll have with the industry is that, yes, it's well and good that uh, government is able to give us incentives and funding. However, there is another element within the value chain, marketing and distribution. So um, you are left on your own to make sure that your final product is able to reach the intended market. So I think it's something that we would want to also probably um, reflect on uh, in terms of the entire value chain, what needs to be done. For uh, almost like a, a, I would say a year, I was in intensively in the NFT space. Uh, I survived it. 
Um, but one of the things that I really thought was interesting in, in ways in which that the tech industry was organizing was the creation of DAOs, of like creating and trying to monetize community with like sort of some of the social enterprise capital building that they were doing. I mean, some of them had really sketchy results. Some of them like are continuing onwards. And I think that that's like one of an interesting way of us connecting our audiences back into actually participating in the investment into the work that we're doing. And perhaps maybe that is one of the key pieces that we never really necessarily think of that we feel like we have to do 80, 90% of the work until it's marketing and then the audience is, is participating in the buying of our cultural product. Whereas like we have much more way of thinking of it as getting our audiences involved first and thinking of long-term investments, like in terms of like long-term like supporting a studio or long-term supporting um, a film, like that it can go on into other ways and ways that they can participate not only by consuming the film, but also being part of like the social part of it and also now like the investing part of it. Like, um, and I think that's just one of Oh, it's a, I think it's an interesting opportunity, spe especially for the African continent, where we are always undersourced, underfunded, always disconnected, um, that now perhaps we should shift our thinking in terms of like now going straight, starting from the beginning with the end user and taking them along the journey all the way through. I think we'll have, and now that we have digital tools, like it's much better in uh, ways of us like organizing. And I know crowdfunding had a lot of success for many, many audiences, but now I think we have an opportunity for making audience think, uh, audiences think that this is much of a long-term thing. It's not just this project, but they can participating in the health of a studio or a community of artists or, yeah. Thank you for that. I think that's quite innovative. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. No, 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 I was just emphasizing a point to say it's quite innovative because if you start to get your audiences to understand the product itself and the, the value for the product for themselves in the long term, so I think it's quite an innovative um, approach. Yeah, and I wanted to sort of funnily enough lean into that before you started and now I'm more excited about what you said than what I was going to say. But uh, brilliant, and I'm glad you survived the NFT space. And and I think some people are doing it really well, but it is very new, so it is changing. So, uh, But when you think about it, the crowdfunding, it was kind of like beta testing NFTs. And before that, or alongside that, we have the Patreon type thing. And really merchandising is all about that. And I know one of the Digital Lab Africa Road to Annecy projects ended up making kids' clothes based on the cartoon that they were trying to pitch, which still hasn't been made, but lots of kids have backpacks with their little, I don't know what they are, giraffes on or whatever, and they're really cute. And those kids are all gonna consume that cartoon whenever it's made, but they're also running a whole business now in fashion for kids, which is really, really cool. And it was by accident, because they had to keep the idea alive. So yeah, the value chain missing aspect for me is the ecosystem of creative funding. And there are many instruments here. 12O has been sort of crashed and burned or it doesn't work well. I don't know, I heard that the other day. That's a tax incentive for private incentives. I think it, meant that, that it changed to just three years, which isn't enough time or something like that. But yeah, we need to align to allow for participation in many ways in the economy. And by micro, uh, by using some, uh, some tools in this FinTech space, we can actually microfinance. Uh, so you didn't have to buy a whole Bitcoin, you can just buy pieces of it, or a DAO, you can just buy a piece of it and own that future project. So you said that, I think we are all aware about how Disney is merchandising out of all their, you know, bouquet of, of, of productions. So I think if you can start to think about that as a continent to say, how do we merchandise from what we are producing? Because those guys are making billions. I mean, 
you see how crazy our kids are with those Disney merchandising. And I mean, Disney's not even, okay, let me not even finish that. So I think you understand what I mean. Any other input around the value chain and the ecosystem? But I think we can start from somewhere. Uh, I just want to amplify what Catherine said. It's, it's customer first. I think the challenge with our creative industry in Africa generally is we look to funding first. And a lot of films are made for festivals, not for customers. Customers are not at festivals. Yeah. So other filmmakers are at festivals. So films are being made for other filmmakers, which is great. But that's a very small market, yeah? So it needs to be made with, with customers in mind. Um, and I think the more, I, and I like, I like that, that in forums like this, we're actually hearing the word value chain. Uh, actually, this is the first content forum that I've actually heard the word value chain being mentioned, which is a good thing, because it's normally always about production and production and production. And maybe there's some exceptions with gaming and animation, but in terms of film, Africa doesn't have a production issue. Africa has a consumption issue in terms of film. Yes, yeah, a demand issue, yeah? Most of, is content being consumed? Yes, pirated, yeah? And they're, and they're also consuming international content over local content first, yeah? So there's issues around quota, yeah? In terms of can we potentially look at protecting our industries a little bit from foreign content? just to allow us to get off the ground. And you know, and the rest of the world will say, no, let's have free trade. But it's OK for them to say that. They've had free trade for 100. They, they had their protectionism for 100 years. Yeah, Africa hasn't had that chance since, uh, maybe with a small exception of South Africa. Um, but Africa generally hasn't had that chance to protect its own industry um, before globalization hit it, especially with digital. So how are these industries meant to grow? And that's where. Now the funding comes in, yes, we need some funding to get off the ground, but there's also such a thing as too much funding, you know? Or, or basically, are you producing what your donor wants from you? What is the sort of messaging? Are you compromising your art because of who's funding you, uh, as opposed to making your art for the, for the end consumer at the end of the day? So it raises so many issues. Yeah. The white paper that I made reference to, we also talking about the principle of reciprocity. To say, if I'm watching, if uh, as a country, we have so much content that is coming from wherever, let's let's have reciprocity. Let's have South African content to have a presence in that country as well, uh, so that we are, you know, leveling the playing field. So for me, I think you you you're raising a, a very important issue. I think we're done. Um, Mm. Mm, even in other sectors. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Perhaps for, for the record, no, no, no. Just, I was saying, I think maybe we need the private sector, a private investor in it because they want results. They don't want you to just to, to make a film just for a festival or stuff like that. And, and, you are if, and if you are leaving on a founding, you're just making, as you were saying, like for festivals and everything. But if you have a private investor, uh, at the end of the, the year here, like, where are my money? <laughs> so you will have to, you will have to do everything. That's why. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're very right. In South Africa, we have um, independent development corporation. And they actually work as a private investor to say, if we give you a certain amount of loan, you need to start to make your own repayment. So the product that you, 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 you are producing, you need to make sure that you do have a market for it so that the return on investment can be able to, you know, can realize it. Okay, I think uh, this has been the best group, I must say. Um, I think we've saved about an hour <laughs> in the time that has been allocated to us. And suffice to say, you've been a great group, I must say. Your inputs are greatly appreciated. Um, I don't know whether there is anyone from VETS to say what then happens after this session. Are we allowed to disperse? 
Uh, or are we allowed to probably go and listen if we have time, what other groups are saying? Hi, Doc. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, Doc. Yeah, I was just saying this. This 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 is the best group. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys.
Testing, testing. Sorry to interrupt the very robust engagement and discussions that are happening. Um, when you are ready, we can make our way to the courtyard for the speed networking, if you wish. Um, just an announcement to know that you have that option too, um, to stay here or to join the networking as well in the courtyard. Thank you.